Happy New Year, everybody. I've been thinking that it's time for reflection. So for this video, I'm taking a break from my usual content to bring you a compilation of all the best videos that I released in 2021. I've done my best to make this video entertaining for newcomers and returning viewers alike, choosing the order carefully to make it feel like one long adventure, each story flowing into the next. We are going to start with a series of inspirational home tours in the Southwest, then go to Taos, New Mexico to build an off-grid Earthship tiny house and conclude with an inspirational father and son story in Pennsylvania that sparked a radically off-grid building movement. And it's a long one, my longest video yet. So I've introduced timestamps which allow you to skip ahead or go back to a specific point in the video. Each chapter is labeled in the description below and also in the video's timeline. And don't worry, this isn't a marathon with intros and advertisements and subscribe now after every break. I've cut out all the fluff and just left the good stuff. I'm only going to ask you once for your support and that's right now, because my new year's goal for the year 2022 is to reach 10,000 subscribers. And if what I do inspires you, then please consider subscribing. And don't forget to turn on notifications if you wanna know every time a video is released. And lastly, as always, you can reach me in the comments section below. I'd love to hear what you think about the video. Your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you, grab your popcorn, sit down, get ready, and enjoy the movie. They're so big. And after that, we became awesome. I couldn't drink because if I did this. <laughs> Up next, I'm going to the American Southwest, the birthplace of the self-sufficient Earthship housing movement. I'll be touring off-the-grid houses of all shapes and sizes, from classic designs to wild fantasy homes, including a special tour of one of the original Earthships, built by pioneers of the movement who literally created the Earthship Academy. I gotta say, this uh, Earthship that I'm about to give you a tour of is a truly inspirational story and example of how determination and hard work over a long time can lead to your dreams being actualized. This particular house was built by Kirsten Jacobson, who is the former educational director and creator of the Earthship Academy at Earthship Biotecture in the greater world of New Mexico. Um, I mean, I really can't say enough about what Kirsten has done for this movement. This, though, is the story of her beginnings. When she first came out here and was inspired to build her own home, she started off small and then over years uh, built her house out. And so this is the final product of her years of work that she now rents out on Airbnb. Um, we were able to come in when there was a gap in the schedule and spend a night here. And just before I leave, I wanted to walk through the house and uh, show you around. Let's check it out. So welcome, welcome to one of the most desired and uh, acclaimed Earthships in the greater world community for its uh, modern design. The house has been featured by the Smithsonian, Forbes, and Airbnb magazine. And if you want to find this house on Airbnb, I'm going to have a link in the description. It's called the Taos Earthship Modern Mesa. You can also find it on Kirsten's profile. She is a super host. She's been on Airbnb for over 10 years and has two other Earthships on there. So you can go check her profile out. As you can see, it was a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of introducing some modern elements into the Earthship um, interior design elements like a uh, stainless steel kitchen countertop and and then also, it's uh, quite a high ceiling structure and that makes it feel very roomy. It also only has one pane of glass between you and the outside, which is indicative of the earlier Earthship models. Over here you can see the systems in the closet. So this is your charge controller, your main panels, and the inverter that gives you AC electricity. And then a few extra things like some compost and garbage can. 
some nice built-in shelving that's not funky or crazy above with some adobe plastering in between. This is a 1300 square foot building. It's one bedroom and one bathroom and it was completed in 2006. The modern and Mesa Urship was built slowly in phases over eight years by your host, Kirsten. The project started with the construction of a small hut, dome room around 120 square feet, the local size limit for a structure that may be built without a building permit. So originally, Kirsten started by building the hut or a yurt which you can see in this room here. So right now, obviously, it's just being used for storage. Yeah, so the acoustics in this room are really cool because it's dome-shaped. Um, there's one skylight in the middle, which is operatable by a little rope that comes down. But this was, you know, and still is, uh, remains one of the easiest ways to get yourself into a structure. Uh, really quickly if you're an owner builder is just to build as small as you can and go bigger from there out of pocket rather than taking out a loan from the beginning depending on what your budget is and in this case the story was that you know a lot of these pioneers came out to the greater world and they built structures like this Kirsten is an example of how she was able to create something very small and affordable in the beginning and then build off onto it and So it's saying that the second structure that was built after the hut was uh, the kitchen area with the French doors and then the third final addition was the bathroom, planter cell, and the bedroom. And it was completed in 2006. And while Kirsten might have done things the hard way, she knows that that's not a right fit for everyone. Her company, The Eco Living Matrix, is committed to helping people find solutions that are right for them through online courses podcasts and ebooks she's hoping to help individuals find the right steps that they need to take towards a new off-grid lifestyle i think the coolest thing about this house has to be the bathroom she's created a beautiful clear glass bottle wall on the inside and outside of the bathroom partition, which when you're in here taking a nice bath and the lights are on outside and you dim the lights in the bathroom, you can see the bottles glowing like gems. And then when you're inside the bathroom with the lights on and someone's out in the bedroom at night, you can see the bottles glowing in the opposite direction, which leaves for a really cool aesthetic effect. and really just did an excellent job finishing off all of the bottle work because it is really hard to get a nice smooth surface. I think the uh, thing that's most beloved a lot of times about the aesthetic of our ships is the bottle walls and like I said this one really does a great job both from a layout standpoint and the craftsmanship of making the bottle wall itself and its simplicity. Um, that gravitates people back to this building over and over again uh, for inspiration on how to do bottle walls in the future, as well as the planter cell. And the planter cell here is awesome and healthy with big banana trees and geraniums and aloe plants and a spider plant. Um, yeah, just really great feeling to have inside the home of um, plants and freshness and green. Um, Every time that you're, you know, taking a shower or running the sink, you know that you're watering this indoor garden. So um, this is personally my favorite aspect of the Earthships. And the best way to learn about Earthships is by building one. I created the Earthship model kit to put an Earthship in everyone's hands. I took everything I learned from the Earthship Academy and boiled it down into a simple and easy to understand 32 page full color booklet which has all new diagrams to help you learn about the six design principles that make Earthship some of the most sustainable buildings in the world.
This great educational package has been used in both the Earthship Biotexture Academy classroom and in classrooms around the world. Forgot to mention the water organizing module here, which has filters necessary to filter rainwater and an extra drinking water filter. And then on demand hot water heater and a pressure tank. So these blinds are great. Um, all the windows have them and they're really easy to operate. So that is one thing that can be a problem with our ships is that they can get too much sun or the windows can be letting a little bit of cold through. And so depending on, you know, what time of year it is and what the temperature is like, you might want to close the blinds like we did when it got really cold and snowy outside. And you might even want to close the blinds when there's sun. But the thing about this airship that, like I said, is nice is that it's modern. You know, these blinds are nothing fancy, um, but they really do the job. And every single window has the same efficient, awesome set of blinds. Um, and then in the bedroom here, so we got cool decorative lamps. Um, the whole house has cool decorative lamps. You can also see that the whole ceiling is just white, you know, and normally there's these big exposed vigas, and that's a lot more work. The, uh, the other difference with this building, which is kind of cool, is, is that, you know, obviously saves on expense and is a design detail. You could choose to take it or leave it. The bed, basically just a modern bed plopped down in the room, and you can see here wood floors. Aside from the entire wall being adobe, which is really impressive and, you know, has a great feel to it, um, everything else in here is just what you'd find in a normal modern apartment. It's a really cool place. I recommend it. All right, we got to go. From the older guru to the younger guru. See you later. There's a fun video log that goes along with this home tour that if you want to check it out, my dad and I had a really interesting experience in this Airbnb. It's fun, it's candid, and if you want to have a good time, take a look. Last year, my dad and I caught up with some old friends who we haven't seen in eight years since we met them at the Earthship Biotexture Academy in Taos, New Mexico in 2012. Like many others, Tom and Deborah were dreaming of the off-grid life and went to the Earthship Academy with the hopes that they would learn the skills they needed to make their dreams into a reality. Since then, traveling back and forth from Arizona, they bought land in Crestone, Colorado and started building. Their first project was converting an old school bus into a hippie camper that they could live in while they started construction on the larger home. The grand vision that they have is huge and it's gonna take some time. But as soon as they had a roof over their heads, they started using the school bus to house volunteers who would help them build their future home. It has become an ongoing community project, and even though it's hard work most of the time, they've made some lifetime friends in the process. From visionary artists like their neighbor Jeff, who's been sculpting a masterpiece for the last 12 years, to fellow off-grid dreamers like Matt and Pete, who started as volunteers pounding tires and decided to buy land of their own down the street and start building their own home. So, in an unexpected twist, my father and I found ourselves living in a hippie bus in Crestone, Colorado, embracing the lifestyle of neighbor helping neighbor, lending a hand where we were needed, and making new friends and documenting the journey along the way. So I'm gonna be releasing home tours and interviews with all of the interesting people that we met, but before that, I'd like to start the journey off in the beginning uh, meeting Tom and catching up with his progress on the house and of course taking a look inside the hippie bus that him and his partner Deborah built. <laughs>
I had no idea what Tom and Deborah had been up to all these years, but man, they really committed to a big project. Tom and Deborah had never built their own house before, and designed the home themselves, drawing inspiration from the classic earthship designs we studied at the Academy in Taos. Among the many design changes was a colistery roof, which created a higher ceiling in the living spaces and let more light into the home. While giving us a tour, Tom explained that almost all the materials they used were recycled or repurposed. Most of the windows and doors they got for free or bought secondhand for a great price. The structural walls are built using old car tires rammed with dirt, a technique that they learned at the Earthship Academy. In the beginning of the project, Tom and Deborah were living in the camper bus parked in front of the house. They have since upgraded to living in their first enclosed room, which allows them to spend the winters on site without constantly fighting to stay warm in the uninsulated school bus. <laughs> what are you doing? I haven't gotten any footage in the bus yet. You haven't gotten any what? I haven't gotten any footage in the bus yet. Oh, you're taking footage. The project has been a massive undertaking so far, and Tom admitted that they might have bitten off a bit more than they can chew. With winter coming fast, they're currently rushing to finish the roof and close in the walls. So during my stay, Tom put me to work, and one of the first jobs that we did together was installing a waterproofing membrane on the roof in order to prepare for the insulation and metal roofing that was going to finish off the project. And while we waited for some more materials to finish up the roof, we decided to start closing in the sidewalls. It was satisfying to put in a good hard day's work, and in the evenings, nature would bless us with some beautiful sunsets. <laughs> what, are you taking movies? In the morning, we'd decide what job we were going to do for the day, and some jobs are more exciting than others, because when you're building it yourself, every tiny detail takes time. Even the smallest job can take half a day, like filling this small gap in the roof. When you've been working on a project for so many years like Tom has, it's hard to get the motivation to just do little projects like this sometimes, and it's just nice to have a friend around to lighten the load. Mm -hmm. You know, it might have been a small job, but we had a fun time doing it. And even though it can be overwhelming at times, all you can ever do is the next step. A big house is built one brick at a time. While we were working, I told Tom about the YouTube channel I was planning to create, and he started to tell me all about the like-minded people that he met here over the last few years. He started to introduce me to some of his neighbors who had also built their own off-the-grid homesteads. Tom was going to help his neighbor Matt with a ceiling installation and could use some help. Matt and his partner were building an earthship nearby and I was eager to meet him. He turned out to be a super cool dude. And luckily for me, he was also a trained EMT, because I ended up blowing a nail through my finger the first day I met him. And after that, we became friends, and Matt invited me back to his home to give me a tour of his crib. When I arrived at Matt's place, we started off the day with one of my favorite activities, throwing around the old frisbee. So if you were wondering why Matt's holding a frisbee in this shot, and in this shot, and in this shot, now you know why. Anyways, Matt and his partner Goldie have been hard at work for three years building their dream home. The tour started when Matt was explaining to me the big mess that he'd made in the yard over the years. Uh, this is it. This is it so far, yeah. <laughs> um, pretty cool. This right here, this mess, this quan this is a, a grain silo. It's actually that out there. It's that in pieces. That's the exact same setup. Um, yeah. 
one day all this mess will be gone, I hope. That's what I'm hoping. There's, you know, we, uh, we were living in that van for a while at the end of the driveway is how we, like, we started out sleeping in the back of, like, a pickup truck with a camper on it, Goldie and I, and then upgraded to the van, then upgraded to her sister's camper trailer thing we had that we gave back, and then, yeah, now we're, yeah, we got a bunch of stuff going on here. This is our, um, the front of our house. It's pretty, it's pretty massive from the road. We went bigger. We did. We started off with a, um, a simple survival, but just went bigger than we should have. You know, our friend talked us into getting more space in there. Um, maybe kind of defeats the uh, the point of the Earthship without the the sun doesn't hit the back walls, the tires. But you know, hopefully it it functions. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did all the stucco, Goldie and I, and put a bathroom on the outside on the other side of the greenhouse. Um, but we can, you want to go in through the front door or where? Yeah. All right. Can we edit that one? <laughs> <laughs> we can. All right, yeah, I'm Matt. Um, this is the house, the earth ship that my partner Goldie and I built together. Um, yeah, and here's a, here's a little tour, right? It's the greenhouse area here. Um, this is our Earthship style uh, planter cell. We did this one above ground. Yeah, we'll end up putting another planter cell over here in the ground. Um, just trying to get maximum like plants going on in here. Some trees. Uh, our bathroom's out here. On the eastern side of the house, or the western side of the house, my bad. Our septic's out there. Um, yeah, luxury ceiling. We're, we were going fancy with the ceiling. We're gonna do this is our shower. It's a walk-in shower. We'll do like you know like a like a ferro cement wall here or something. Maybe throw a bottle or two in if we get can get there. But yeah, it's just a walk-in shower. Um, all tiles. This will all be tiled. Sink goes here. Um, toilet. Uh, we just we just plastered this wall. Actually, this was a tire wall. So we're pretty pretty jazzed on this. Pretty jazz in the ceiling right now. How'd you find Creston? She had already done the whole Earthship thing, was kind of like, always wanted to build an Earthship when I met her. She educated me on it, we listened to a bunch of Mike Reynolds speeches, and she brought me to Creston and was like, this is where, you know, I always wanted to do this. And, but I got here and I just like looked around and I was like, wow, this place, not half bad. I could just, you know, I envisioned it. I was like, I saw it. I was like, this, this, is, this is it. We can do this, you know. 2016, I first came here, and we went to Thomas and Devers, and I pounded my first tire. Sweet. At Thomas and Devers. Okay, yeah. so that's the that's the connection there. So yeah. we were, they were already like eight courses up, you know. You pounded so, your first tire. So my Thomas first tire Devers. was like on the eighth course at Thomas and Devers. Uh, there'll, be, there'll be a bathtub here. Um, definitely, and maybe like some weird kind of awning thing over it. Maybe like a little place for a bed up there, like a little guest, a little cozy nook or something. Oh, um, that's a door to our bedroom. Over there. This is, yeah, like our living space pretty much is what we're, you know, calling it. Um, this is our kitchen sink, counters, uh, stove, fridge, uh, island here. Like a movable island because we like open space. My vision is like piano and then there'll be like a little couch area, a place where you can stretch out. We'll put a wood stove in here. I'm a big fan of wood heat. There's not a lot of wood here. Hopefully you won't have to use it much, but it's nice just to like get some wood heat going. I just, I love it. Um, and then yeah, so that'll be flagstone under here, under where the wood stove is. And then, um, you know, rest of the floors are gonna be earthen with radiant floor heat in here, just as a backup. I haven't really thought it through about the radiant floor heat yet, but we're just putting the pecs in and then figuring it out later, you know. I heard it was smart to do it, so. So we were like driving around looking for land, just talking about it, looking for land. And then we saw this old faded sign off in the desert over here. 
we started building, you know, that was the big thing. We like got the dozer, we bought the land, that was huge. Like dude, the day we got one raptor on this roof was like, it went from just sticks to like, wow, here we go. Yeah. You didn't just come here to buy land to build a house, you came here to have an education. Totally, and I've learned so much, so much, like, yeah probably learn more in this three years than I've learned maybe in like any three years of just like, any takeaway lessons like good nuggets yeah just tons and tons just experience I feel like almost everything you do is based on experience and like you have to wear so many hats when you're building your own home like you can go from being a framer to an electrician in like you know drop of a hat Baldos myself I had a buddy who like told me how to hook it all up he would just come over every day and be like now hook these up and then leave come back over and be like now hook that up you know he kind of just held my hand through it um but yeah I did a lot I did this install pretty much with help that was fun learned learned a lot you know Matt and Goldie took a leap of faith and it seemed like the universe had aligned to help them at every turn every story he told me was filled with unbelievable bargains and friends who went the extra mile to help them out they always seem to be in the right place at the right time. A lot of this is recycled material, so uh, we were just throwing it together and trying to get in as fast as possible. Did you did you use some uh, like reclaimed windows, those small reclaimed windows that you bought? From... No, we didn't buy any custom glazing. I built that around our windows we got for like free. Whoa, you got yeah. all this glazing for free? Dude, we set the post oh to the window. God. We got the windows first. And then you we... got all this glazing for free? Uh, <laughs> you see those white ones up top? Yeah. The big long light ones? Uh-huh. 20 bucks or 10 bucks a pop. And then we bought the two operables. But like the, all this stuff is like salvaged from Craigslist. And oh, then like, man. like one time I got nine windows. I had to help the dude. I wanted to help the dude dismantle the windows out of the out of the you know their frames and then I gave him 50 bucks for the windows and helped him pull them out and he gave me three solar panels two batteries all the wiring for the batteries three hydro solar panels and just let me store all this shit on his on his house gave me a bunch of flashing like whoa yeah I gave him 50 bucks and he gave me like all these things that I'm like using you know like by accident on some ceilings we had a really good deal on craigslist on some pro panel what about um, this wall here which wall this one. Oh, this wall so this is um they sell like these like they're like d cuts or they call them like firewood slabs and they're pretty much just like i'll show you what one looks like real quick they come looking like this you know in a big on a big pallet and they're like 75 bucks, and you get like a ton of these. Like a, one pallet was way more enough to do both those sides. And so I just, you know, sanded them down, put a little water sealant on, and then uh, filled the cracks with uh, earthen, like an earthen plaster with a little bit of like wheat paste in it, um, and just sifted it out real well, you know. And what's that technique? That was just, they call it chinking, I'm pretty sure. But that, I just did my own version. We just had some earthen plaster lying around, and it's like, you know, it's just like sifted earthen plaster that we bought um, and pre made it a tote. And then we just sifted it out and added a little bit of wheat paste, and that's what that is. And you know, this is a really awesome community. Like, you know, I don't know everyone in it, but the, you know, the portion of people that I know and hang out with, I, I love them. You know, we're like, we're a family. Our buddy helped us plaster it. He does pools and he came down for, um, you know, like three days and helped us, you know, do this like texture on there, that plaster. He helped us set all these. He brought the rock down. This dude totally like hooked us up, like a really good friend of ours. Which is like the story with a lot of this stuff. Like our friends really like pulled through on like for this house. Like there's just so many friend hours in this house, you know. You put a nail through your finger yesterday helping us out. So, you know, that's, yeah, hours and hours of like shit like that. You know? Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. Mm. Yo, check it out. That's what it looks like today. Oh, that's great. So it's got a little in and a little out. Perfect. Hole. Perfect. 
Yeah, no, it was interesting to have the nail go through and out, and then for me to know that it went through and out, and then also have to pull off of it oh, yeah. and then come down. But yeah, anyways, that's... Thanks for that, man. That's, that's the ceiling <laughs> work, man. That's the brotherhood yeah. work trades. That's the Earthship style cooling tube. Uh, you know, the wind will blow from the north and run under uh, the cool ground, and so that'll cool the wind off blowing through and cool our house. And so we have cooling tubes down here and then operable windows up in the corner over there. And like, this is all an experiment. I'm just hoping that's gonna be enough airflow for this house. You know, like I put these in here cause I was kind of in a pinch and they're just fixed windows, but maybe we'll have to come in and throw some operables later. In the winter. Yeah, so the idea is in the winter time on December 21st, I think the sun um, comes back here about seven feet is where we get it. Um, so that'll heat this whole floor. And like, like you can feel it in the shoulder seasons right now how like much, how warm this room gets. You know, like this room here, I have these open all day, like and pretty much all night. And it's, you know. It gets chilly at night if those are open, but if you shut those, it's pretty consistent in here, and it'll heat up in the day. Um, and then, yeah, like, I've come in here in the winter. I've slept in here a bunch at, like, you know, like, 10 below zero and stuff, and just ran the wood stove, and that was with, and that was with no glass here. So we're just, we don't even know. I like sometimes I drive by it multiple times just to like stare at it, you know? <laughs> Cuz I'm like, wow, it's really big and we we did that. It's kind of we it's kind of crazy, you know, that we did that. So, yeah. The works behind us. It's a good feeling. Yeah, we did some this is what you get when you um, you know, when you DIY stuff. You learn the hard way, <laughs> but you get through it. Yeah, this is a beautiful job that you did on the, the flashing here. It's actually a really, really clean um, example of how you can finish off a front face and uh, make it look good. I mean, it's it's not easy. I went a little crazy with that round caulking. Uh, Goldie did the color, color arrangement, and I just kind of, like, did the idea for, like, you know, we just ordered this from the local roofing company. Um, yeah, they were just channels. I just gave them dimensions and they just bent them and cut them and we got to pick our color out. So this is covering up those two, um, you know, sister two by fours. And then the cedar on the outside, we stained the cedar with like eco wood or something like that. And these are covering the posts. I mean, it got a little wavy, but whatever, you know. Yo, let's take a look at the roof. You want to go up on the roof? I feel like a lot of construction is just like, common sense you know overlapped you're like okay you do this you do that and you just got to backtrack and you do mock it up you know figure it out you know builders know that to do a little mock up yeah it's a massive roof man there's a lot of metal up here so when you had leftover metal, you put it on the inside ceiling? We just, we, you know, we miscounted. We had a miscount and we had a bunch left over. And so we just, we had the materials. A lot of it is like, you see all the crap lying around. Well, I'm, I'm constantly trying to like use these materials that we picked up. So, and then, you know, recycling materials, you wind up putting a lot um, of labor into recycling. Like you, like, yeah, tires are free, but how long does it take to pack a tire? Or, like, those D-logs over there were 75 bucks, but it took me forever to, like, prep them to put them up on the wall. And, you know, and then, like, you know, I feel like we just got lucky with the, the roofing. It sound right, boys. You were like a student. Yes. You so, came in knowing nothing. You know, yeah. It's, and you have there's funding. so many things here that I have never done before. And, you know, yeah. a lot of the stuff you're looking at I hadn't done before. And anyone can do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah, definitely. 
Yeah, I just needed to flip the perspective at the end there for everybody who's watching so that do you it. understand yeah, exactly. you can just do it. It's I mean, rewarding. Do it. You have to work to get there. It's a lot of work to get there. And to learn. Yeah, learn it, do the work. But just, you know what? You yeah. have fun. So much fun. And you learn. So much fun, yeah. Just la Dude, just being on the job site with good people is like an amazing experience. And I feel like that's what really motivated Goldie um, with Earthship. Like that's where Earthship, like, that, I feel like that's what Earthship did for her. What she took away from that was just like, she had this companionship. And when you're on the job site and you're in crappy conditions, it's like, and you're sharing this moment, like you can either be with someone who's gonna be like, wow, this sucks and keep saying it sucks. Or you could be the dude that's sitting there like laughing like this, yeah. you know, whatever, yeah. man. Like, let's laugh let's about what it. can you do, you know? Yeah. Let's get this done. And then when you turn around at the end of the day with construction, at least, it's like, whoa, we did that. Yeah. You know, you're so involved in it and you're not really stepping back and looking. And when you like, you forget and you step back and look, you're like, yes. Yes. Like, this yes. is it. It's worth it. Yep. It's all worth it. Like, Matt also had a YouTube channel and hosts a podcast with yet another Earthship owner builder named Pete. Pete also happened to be building an Earthship down the road. Seriously, I'm not making this stuff up. And so, after discovering that there was another YouTuber in Crestone, I got my gear ready, picked up the phone, gave him a call, and asked him politely for an interview. And here's the home tour for you. Here we are coming at you, Crestone, Colorado. This is Matt and Pete. Meet Pete and his dog, Isabella. They live in a 900 square foot, totally off-grid Earthship studio in Crestone, Colorado. It's going to be highlighting a lot of videos and how-to videos of the processes that we've gone through in the past, just really trying to help people out and have owner builders and empower owner builders to you know, do their thing. With a bachelor's degree in music technology and audio recording, Pete has been working hard to build a home studio. The inspiration first came in his last year of college, when he started to make passive income by selling the rights to a video he posted that went viral after it got 11 million views. Here we go. One, two, three, go. All these TV shows started to call. It was on Tosh.0. Oh, it was on shit. Jimmy Kimmel, <laughs> it was on fucking... It was on Tosh? It was on Tosh, it was on uh, MTV, Rob Dyrdek, Ridiculousness, all these Whoa. places, and it was usually like $500 for them to license like the 30 second clip to it. The royalties helped him afford his last year of college, but the checks eventually stopped. However, it did get him thinking about passive income, which led him to the idea of passive housing. Uh, I was working at a place called Sweetwater Sound in Fort Wayne, Indiana for three years after college, uh, and I didn't like Indiana. Um, I was, you know, kind of wanting to change it up from working in an office and talking on the phone all day and discovered Earthships and discovered that my aunt and uncle were living in Taos, New Mexico, 10 minutes away from all the stuff that was going down. So I was like, hey, saved up some money, wanted to find a place with no building codes. Uh, and that's kind of one of the things Earthship talks about are pockets of freedom. Found Creston and found my friend Thomas and Deborah who were also building an Earthship. Have a community of people that can be helpful is very big time. I feel like that's half the reason why Earthship does so well in the past, you know, 30 years is because they always have people that get inspired by what Mike Reynolds is trying to do and come volunteer or help out or do something similar. And it's like, it's a team. Yeah. You know, it's like, if I just went, uh, hey, I'm gonna go buy 40 acres in the middle of the county and I'm an hour away from my friends or whatever like that. Hey, I'm gonna go move in the woods somewhere and it's like, there's not uh, like-minded people that are right down the road that are doing the same thing. It's tough. And like, I'm a perfect example of that's a that's never done it before went to earthship for a month got inspired Ugh. and came out here three four years later and i'm in a house no rent <clears throat> no electricity bill no water bill yeah you know i pay a hundred dollars a year on county taxes still you know so it's like <laughs> sure i live in a property owner association where i have to pay 400 bucks a year kind of sucks but 
check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. I've never done it before, so I'm totally green to all this stuff, and I've done a fair amount in three years. But it sounds like in three years you've learned a heck of a lot about what it's like to build in the so-called pocket of freedom that is it this. It is, and I think that's what people that are, how would you say, like that have blind ambition or that are like Trustafarians are like, oh yeah, I'm just going to build an earthship. Like, I think a lot of people have a lot of hope. And like a lot of stuff is, you know, again, blind ambition. They want, you know, it sounds good and it sounds like a great deal, but it is a lot of work. You have to like, just like anything, you have to put a lot of work into something if you want it. It is a pocket of freedom. And, and what I mean by that is literally, if you tried to do this in any other county that had whatever they call UBC's universal building codes, you wouldn't be able to do it. You know period end of story so like even though you might have to still pull some state electrical permits maybe a state plumbing permit septic permit through the county you still can do it That thing that you can find people that are doing like-minded thing, whether it's Earthship type of folks or whether it's just people that are into like off-grid building. Like I've met so many people that are building cool straw bale houses, cool, uh, you know, rammed earth houses, cool, uh, you know, ferro cement house, like all these different scria bag houses, like all these different types of building because there's no building codes makes people that are like do-it-yourselfers, you know, people that are like, hey, because of no building codes, I'm going to go build my house easier than it would be if I built a house in Denver. We just interviewed Tom, Matt, and Pete, three builders whose homes are inspired by Earthship Biotexture's self-sufficient design principles. All three chose a similar passive solar design using the same recycled building techniques such as rammed earth tire walls and recycled glass bottle bricks. However, in this video, we are going to take a look at a wacky home that uses a variety of other building techniques. Tom helped build this house and wanted to give my father and I a look inside. From a distance, the home looked rather strange but the closer we got, the more interesting it became. That's in, now. See, I've never seen earth berm done this way because it's it's. He's got these he retained stone it. stone towers. Yeah, he retained and it. And then, then he's got the retaining wall, and you can really get away with that here because the climate's so dry. The wood works perfectly. Yeah. Piles on top of the roofing material and then there's a bunch of layers of foam underneath that. Yeah. That's a really cool brick wow. wall. Yeah, so he basically built the earth bag here, but it's not earth bag, it's got scoria in the bags instead of dirt. So it's basically what he got in the scoria, the, what is that? the the lava rock, you know, you see Mark oh, okay. used the red. Yeah. Yeah. Um, scoria. Yeah. And then he added this on. This is all masonry, masonry block here. And then he did this, uh, these are I don't know where he salvaged these from, but that's sort of somewhat of somewhat of a tron wall. Um, so now he's got I love the way they did this window. Yeah, he's got another one in the shed, same way. Yeah. Uh, recycled brick on the floor. I don't, I'm not sure what the plaster is. What's below the uh, brick? Um, Sand, I think you might have some gravel in there, and then uh, probably rigid insulation. So the floors are insulated. These are, uh, this is pavers, the floor is pavers, and um, uh, sawed off uh, four by four by 12. 
you can see these are like little thin layers of oh yeah so it alternated the floor pattern there um so it's one of the most uh, that centrifugal uh forget what you call that type of uh roof right there reciprocal that's, roof that's pretty trick the way they overlap and somehow yeah. they all tie in that's dope yeah um so that was an addition there's the, the uh, addition here he had a rocket stove in the floor right here rocket stove uh, gravity fed mm -hmm. you know in the top and it vents out through the bench right here the vent goes out through this bench out through that bench and then it went out of the house but because he was selling it he the bank wouldn't uh you know give someone a loan with that type of uh heating uh heat source and then just uh, another little room here with a whopping three bedrooms the house is now listed on airbnb Tom shared with us his insider knowledge and the fact that the building had been created in phases and with every new organic addition, another interesting quirk. This was walled off for a little bit. He, you know, he hadn't had, didn't have this finished. So this was here, but there were bags here. Then he, then he did the addition and then he knocked out the wall. So the first bag. Um, this is a cattle panel. I think this is a cattle panel vault. So basically it just takes those big cattle panels, big, big wire grid, basically. They come in big, big long sections, mm -hmm. wire tie them together and then make your arch and then lath, a diamond lath on that, you know, sort of earthship style kind of a, mm -hmm. a vault. Yeah, you used to be able to see the earth bags in here, but um, he pretty much buried them all. You can see a couple back. He met his girlfriend, they ended up getting married and they wanted more room, you know? So that's where they used to sleep up there. It used to have a yurt dome on it, but it was like way too bright. Yeah. So he took the yurt, the clear dome off the center there uh -huh. and, and replaced oh. it with that uh, sauna, that uh, solar tube there, that sauna tube or whatever that's called. Interesting. Huh. You can play that backwards, it'll look like I'm going up. My father and I hit the ground running, filming four home tours in the first week. It was a lot of work, and after my father injured his back, we decided to get some rest and relaxation at a local hot springs in the nearby town. Now this wasn't originally planned to be part of the documentary, but when we got there, we met an unexpected surprise. And I don't know about you, but I love some geodesic dome greenhouses. The Valley View Hot Springs in Moffat, Colorado is an oasis in the desert. A sacred site with a deeply peaceful atmosphere. New COVID restrictions meant that there were less people in the spa, and we had to book our spot ahead of time. As we entered the spa, it felt like being transported to another realm.
A dreamy place where sacred geometry lined the walls. Where three pools got gradually warmer and all had the same breathtaking view. For my father, it was simply relief from his nagging back pain, but for me, it was a realm of wonder and beauty as I left my father behind and went exploring. First I found teepees, which stood tall and mighty against the horizon. This happens to be the location where I filmed the last clip of my channel intro. I walked the meditation labyrinth. And met the angel at the center, whose mask was making a silent statement about the worldwide pandemic. Exiting the labyrinth, I saw several small yurts and a geodesic tiny house, which they rent out to overnight guests. And that's when I saw her, standing there, beautifully in the sunlight, her pentagonal geometry calling me closer. A geodesic dome greenhouse like this one is a dream for most off-grid homesteaders, and even though I've studied how to build them, and seen many pictures, I've never stepped foot in one. Going inside was like teleporting from the dry desert to the rainforest. I was greeted with the sound of running water, the smell of flowers. And lush green plants surrounding me. I returned to the sound of our Tibetan bowl, as my father played it beside him in the water while he meditated. A sound that you might recognize from the intro of all my videos. Instruments like this are great for reducing stress and anxiety and can help with sleep problems when used right before bed. He attracted the attention of some of the guests who were eager to experience the magic for themselves. We made some new friends, <laughs> and our time at the hot springs was up. <laughs> That's when my father and I got the opportunity to meet Nikki and Zuki, 
a musician and a midwife who started their off-the-grid homestead 20 years ago. And what they've created in that time is inspirational. They have six buildings, including an Earthship studio and an Earthship-inspired underground greenhouse. And they welcomed us into their home for a tour, which I'm very excited to share with all of you. Welcome. <laughs> this is our home, and we're uh, Nick and Zuki. I'm Zuki. This is I'm Nick. Nick. <laughs> <laughs> More brown part. Oh. And um, I just enjoy nature, and I had always wanted, as a teenager, even started thinking about in the future what I wanted to do and um, where I wanted to live. I wasn't too sure uh, for many years, but I landed here in Colorado in 1997 and fell in love with the beauty in the mountains. And this community, which I had no idea at the time, was actually one of the few communities, I think, uh, in the United States that um, basically embraced um, any kind of building in this county um, where you could build with anything you wanted, as long as, I guess, electric and plumbing were to code for the state. But in the county itself, you could build out of Cans, bottles, straw, uh, tires, paper um, crete, sandbags, <laughs> anything you wanted. Um, Pumice crete. And I didn't even know that, but so I landed in the right place. And when I figured it out, um, I tires. started. Start, yep. Great, I said that. Wow. <laughs> With the freedom to build anything, Nikki and Zuki let their imagination run wild drawing inspiration from the can and bottle walls that make Earthship houses so aesthetically appealing. It's one of the first bottle walls we did. Yeah, we messed up quite a bit <laughs> with, the, you know, trying to fit wood. You're supposed to put nails, right? Pine, pine what do they call it? Uh, porcupining. And I didn't do that, but on newer ones we did. I forgot about that. Yeah, but it's all right. Around every corner and everywhere you looked was another bottle wall. Yeah, these were all, everything we've been doing with bottles so far has been with the help also of the woofers we have for six months out of the year. Um, so all these planters here were done this year with our woofers in the front here. Um, these were done a different year with some other woofers. Very photogenic kitty, huh? You're very photogenic. And I love the bottles for planters because you don't have to cut them. So you just put whole bottles in and, and they're really beautiful. Because you see the other bottles. So in these, we did use plastic. And Those up there, the there's some nice up ones up there. These were some of our very first... And we filled them with sand. Yeah, because they were kind of cheap plastic. So we did put sand in these because they'll collapse with the weight of the mortar. And then I took some old pottery and stuck it in there. You know, I felt like I broke something that week. I think we were making this a pot. But these and are probably the only ones that have plastic yeah. bottles in them. Yeah, I don't know if I like the thin plastic. The hard, The harder... Like the soda bottle plastic that looks like a flower on the bottom, I like that. That works out good. They even had a bottle wall chicken coop. Yeah, I love it. I love creating, I love designing. And this was always a cooperative. So my clients, I'm a midwife and my clients actually for the first 15 years I was here, traded um, services to me for caring for them. So even all the straw bales uh, in this house and in the cottage were all donated by a client. Then I had another client build the kitchen and another guy might come and do some you know, bookshelves for me. I mean, it was just such a cooperative. So that's why I call it creative birth choices, because it's creative. <laughs> we make it creative and fun. Um, a lot of my clients have done art, murals, and pretty little like art things on the fireplace and in the bathroom. And 
And so I want to continue that because I think the exchange is, is just a nicer way than mo just money. You know, I like trading. The main house is the heart of the homestead where meals are made and bathrooms are located. Zuki has two large bathtubs dedicated to performing water births for her clients. The living room is earthy and grounding. Like being in a giant womb. And at the center of it all stands a monument to the Sacred Mother, the giver of life. The community was very few when I moved here, maybe two, three hundred people year round. Um, and then I met Nick in 2009 and he moved down here in 2011 and started helping me build. And I had this main house built already. I had a straw bale home and a little straw bale cottage. Um, other than that, everything else we've done together. Since Nikki moved in, they have been very busy building four new structures on the property, including an adorable tiny dome home, a portable tiny home, and two Earthship-inspired structures made using rammed earth tire bricks. The first is an Earthship studio, and the other is a Wallenpini-style underground greenhouse. I was lucky enough to get a guided tour on two separate occasions, once during the interview, and again at Nikki's birthday party. So if you're wondering why he has a cowboy hat and a beer in some scenes and not others, now you know why. So, so, so this is an Earthship hybrid. It's not a traditional Earthship by any means. This is our first attempt, and I'll show you this after, but that's entirely an Earthship greenhouse. So in this Earthship, there's no greenhouse aspect. It's entirely a greenhouse. That's entirely and an that's Earthship just a house. greenhouse. And this is just gonna be, I Earthship. call it an yeah. Earthship master suite. <laughs> It's a detached uh, greenhouse. <laughs> it's a detached greenhouse, yeah. So all of these planters are made out of pallet wood and scrap uh, from the building material. Got these bricks used at a yard sale from my dad. Those beds. Um, Dude, let's see inside. Let's see inside the crib. <laughs> Welcome to cribs. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. So this is all pallet wood over here uh, as a faux wall. Uh, Zuki didn't care for the mortar look, and she wanted to be able to hang pictures and... and Way more utilitarian. Like that, you know. It's and, the whole thing's a nailer. Right, so, you know, we're still, we've got all the pallets for free pretty much. And there's tires up to here as well. Uh -huh. This is all tires. We were running out of daylight, and we had to cut the tour short. But Nikki was generous enough to give me another tour the next day. Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. Move it open because it's kind of dark. Oh, geez. This is so much better, though. Wow. Yeah, I, I couldn't wait to get back in here and actually have a little bit of light because I love all the woodwork you guys really and especially the joinery that you use at the top here of the post and beam. Right, yeah. And that was done because um, we had a dilemma that we really should have done this first. So we did after the roof was up <laughs> and we had to... We actually had to raise the roof. Yeah, we had to kind of jack up the roof a bit to fit the post in, yeah. or the beam in. So that was the only way to slide it, and like up instead of under. And they were only $30 each. Yeah, he, he's amazing, <laughs> he's so, like. So all the posts you see were $30 each, and they were like super, they were even taller than this. Yeah. We had to cut them. That guy is just amazing. <laughs> and um, they go deep, they go, 
you know, down as well. Recycle pallets too, because it's beautiful wood. According to their calculations, it only costs them about ten to fifteen thousand dollars to make, which they attribute mostly to the cost of lumber, cement, and a little bit of labor. And the kitchen dining area. So solar and the one gravity water system is, is all that the house has. We didn't do a greenhouse in here because we have a nurseship greenhouse just right next door. Right. <laughs> a whole greenhouse just for that. So. I'll have <laughs> yeah, so so along the front wall we decided to do shelving and uh, you know, bookcases and, and stuff like that. And, yeah. But it's pretty cool. Yeah, this is you know, it's not a traditional airship, it's a hybrid. Just under a thousand watt system. Um, four panels, 250 watt panels. Um, but I got the 2000 uh, watt inverter because it had the hard wire so I could hardwire it to my breaker, uh, which I wired the house uh, as well uh, with some DC disconnects and then uh, solar panels on the roof. Idea for the battery. Oh, that's cool. I've never seen like yeah. that. Four six volt batteries you know, to make a 24 watch. volt system. And I just drilled some holes in the back for some ventilation on it. And it's um, not like an eyesore because it's such a close, close, I could put a blanket on there or whatever. And don't forget, Nick, to mention you were a novice before this. So anybody can oh, probably yeah. learn. <laughs> how to set up their own solar system if they're inclined to. I was not, so I let him do it. But um, I would just go buy candles if it were up to me. So I just hooked up the gas line again. The first gas line leaked, but I got this one. It's a water tank for rain catchment going into our uh, kitchen sink. This is the pad where the outhouse is gonna be, which we're gonna be building here in the next week or so, but we gotta get rid of the stump first. How long did it take you to build it? Four years. And it was mainly me, my stepson Zach, Zuki, and then uh, Woofers. Like I said, maybe a carpenter or two along the way. Uh, but mainly it's just been a uh, family project. All money out of pocket. And uh, so it's been a slow go, but it's been good. Four years. And not every day. You know, the winters here are very cold. So, uh, and a lot of snow. So it's really only been maybe, you know, eight, nine months out of the year that we can build. It's amazing what Nikki and Zuki have created here. It feels like I'm standing in a real life example of a place that I've dreamed of building during my years studying off-grid homesteading. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. It's finally time to take a look inside their underground greenhouse. It sound right, boy. We decided just to make it a greenhouse. Yeah, they did this a couple of years ago. They did, did this when we moved here. And so, this one... Uh, we had this house before. Well, we we both, actually, we dug down. Wow. Uh, this one we dug down a little bit further than the other one, but the other one we actually like, dug out um, four feet down as well. Oh. Uh -huh. So wow, it didn't feel like it because we walked in on ground level, but it was actually four feet down from it's like the, bios the real ground level. Garden. This is... This is Four feet down. This is four feet. How much food do you guys get out of here? We get a lot of greens. We mainly grow greens here. We need some herbs, tomatoes, uh, kales, and chards, and peppers. But yeah, we can definitely eat more out of here uh, in the later months. You know, we still have food growing in the main garden behind the house too. So we've been harvesting because it's October. But we eat out of the garden almost year round. There's probably just those few months, like I said, where it gets super cold to where we don't even want to come out and light that wood stove because <laughs> it's just too much. And when did you build this? This was probably 
It was built right before the Earthship, so five, six years ago. And how long did it take to build? Uh, it only took uh, one year. Well, maybe a year and a half, because we built the main structure with the tires and cans, and then um, framing the, the top part and the roof took about another half year, mainly because of weather. The, the cost on this, if the other one was, what, you said maybe maybe $10,000, this, how much could you? Uh... This one, yeah, hardly anything at all. Maybe, you know, maybe three at the most, and that's with uh, just lumber, cement, and labor. Where we live, we don't get a whole lot of rain. Uh, we do get some uh, more in the summertime, um, but we've been kind of in a drought. We just fill it with the hose basically right now. But when we do get a rain, I mean, they're overflowing, you know, all of our rain catchment barrels, you know, and we have a big like thousand gallon right out here uh -huh. for, you know, the emergency if we need it. Nikki had been very generous with his time and family duties were calling. Oh, honey. The end of this tour brings us closer to the end of the story of our time here in Creston. But there's one last thing that I am really, really excited to show you. I don't know exactly how to describe it, but somehow there exists a home that is so bizarre, so sculptural, that it'll only make sense if I show you. For those of you who've been following my story, I've been building up to this video since the launch of the channel. That's because this is the most mind-blowing home tour I've released so far. Jeff and Ruth lived in a small adobe house, right next to the ongoing experimental art installation that they've been building for the last 12 years. Yeah. Tom lives next door and has been a part of the ongoing construction project. This building is certainly one of a kind. Not only was it sculptural, but it was also experimental. On the south side of the building, they installed large panes of glass, which weren't exactly windows. They were there to try and heat up the walls on the south side of this concrete brick and steel rebar structure, which struggled to stay warm during the harsh winters. Unlike the other passive solar houses that we've been looking at, capturing the sun's energy for heating was an afterthought rather than a design feature. However, there were some small windows which gave a glimpse to the mystical world within. And while the building might have struggled to use the sun's energy, it certainly made up for it in other ways, including an elaborate sculptural gutter system that funneled water off the roof into outdoor planter cells where they could have a small herb garden. The design and construction was led by Steve Corner and his company Flying Concrete, his style influenced by the work of Gaudi, and it really shows as you walk the outside of the building. And every window and every door are made custom by local artisans. The frames need to be welded together to fit the structure that they have made. And while the outside of the building might seem a bit random, there's actually a deep wisdom behind its design. The back side of the building provides a glimpse into how the structure was made, using a series of bent steel rebar which is later covered in cement. The design of the structure utilizes the strength of an arch. So while the outside of the building might seem random, the arches seen on the facade actually reflect the inside structure which gives it strength. So all of the features that jump off the side of the building actually act as supports to prevent the building from collapsing on itself. And even though I knew about some of these design features from the outside, I wasn't prepared for what we were about to see. Because the truth is, that the inside of this structure is like entering into another realm.
The tour began in Jeff's studio, which was a massive room with a center pillar that bore the weight of all of the intersecting arches above it. The design allowed for a large dome shape that wasn't too tall and could support the weight of a second story above it, but it also just gave the room an incredible, mystical feeling. That's when I learned that Jeff was a sculptor living in a sculpture. As a sculptor myself, I felt like I had something in common with Jeff and couldn't help but daydream of having a studio like this one day. Okay, Dad, we're going to mosey into the next room. Bruce? Yeah, Bruce. Eric. We followed Jeff deeper into his world. And for a moment, I'd just like to share with you how that felt. Jeff's master suite was the crowning gem of this incredible, mind-blowing, otherworldly, undescribable experience. It wasn't until I looked into the bathroom of the master suite that I realized that this wasn't the end of the tour, and that outside the windows lied the next realm, because the roof was the final destination. First part is kind of starting to frame up right here. The two car garage it looks like. You know, just one. From this view, it was as though we were standing on our own mountain with a stone staircase that seemed to emerge out of the ground and crawl its way up to us on the second story of this gigantic stone castle. The structure was solid and stable, like a giant rock, forming a landscape of its own that we could walk on, play, and explore. Standing there with my father and Tom, I felt inspired and grateful for our time in Crestone. I realized that we had reached the climax of our adventure, which began when we reunited with our old friend and evolved into meeting new friends along the way. I kept the camera rolling, hoping to capture stories capable of inspiring the world. And even though our time in Crestone was over, I felt like my dream had just come true. After my summer in America, I traveled to Sweden to check out some really cool off-grid structures and communities. And even though those videos haven't been released yet, I did film a couple fun travel vlogs while I was there check them out. Okay, what's up everybody? Eric here and I am coming to you from the Swedish Fjell with a video blog uh, impromptu. We're going to a waffle cottage that uh, 
I have no idea how they get their supplies there. I guess a snow scooter comes and brings it in, but um, either way, will they have running water? Is there going to be a bathroom? Uh, it seems like a pretty off-grid place to me. I can't look directly at the camera because it's so bright right now, so I'm just going to be squinting like this the whole time. But anyways, I'm going to see if I can get my questions answered about this uh, off-the-grid waffle cottage. Right, here we are on the uh, fjell, which is a Swedish word for uh, rolling uh, high altitude landscape. We've heard that there's a cafe that's going to serve some waffles at the end of the road here, and I'm concerned how they get electricity and water and other systems, so we're going to go and check it out. Oh, I gotta go. <laughs> is there a bathroom? Do they have running water? What if they're out of what if they're out of milk? What if they're out of milk? Is there Wi-Fi? It's incredible. So there are solar panels and they run lights for in the sleeping area and in here, but we run off a diesel generator, usually. Alright, so right now you're running off a diesel generator? Yeah, we are. The waffle lines take a little too much juice for solar panels. Mm -hmm. uh, so we bring all of our own water up every morning, and we source that from Tucson at Romberia, but in the summertime there's a pump in the lake. Oh. So they bring water over. So it's not running in the winter, but it does in the summer if they wanted it to. Whiskey. Whiskey is a good sport. Whiskey is a good sport. We're a good sport. Magis. Vilken dag. Vilken eftermiddag. Snabba briller. <laughs> All right, here we are in Funestalen in Sweden, in the north, and we have a little bit of sunlight left before we uh, plunge into this uh, freezing cold water to celebrate our friend's birthday. So, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> oh, the stupid boy is coming in. Yeah, du fyller år också, luftburen, birthday bath. You're gonna get baptized. I'm gonna get baptized in ice. Woo! <laughs> hey! December, Funes Dalen. Repping Kung's bed yet. <laughs> Uh, how do you feel? I feel excited. I feel very uh, stoked on this. A bit scared, to be honest. <laughs> Reality is starting to hit me. But um, things going fine. All right. All right. You've done it once before. Yeah, one time. But uh, I was screening top of my lungs. Really? Yeah, I panicked. Like, yeah, I was the first one in. Never uh -huh. saw anyone do that, so uh -huh. I just jumped in and like my lungs emptied over there, and I couldn't like do anything except for get up. What are you gonna do this time to change it? Um, I'm gonna watch David and try to like 
maintain my breathing, deep breaths, just trying to focus and uh, yeah, take it for where it is. Nice. You think you're gonna do better this time? I hope so. Do you want to? I do. Awesome. I do. How about you? I have done it once before in a pond okay. and I think I did pretty, it was deep, it okay. was deep. We, we went down to our shoulders and uh, I think I did pretty okay. We had partied already. This is the first sober time, I think. I think it's gonna be a good experience. <laughs> Det blir ju inte varmare för att Nej, det blir ju inte. Fy helvete! Det är bara kör. Nu behöver inte andas bara. Ja, djupa. Djupa långsamt. Det är god jul! Det är bra. Så är det lugnt. Det är okej. Säg till 30 sekunder om vi drar över det så dör det. Okej, all right. 30! Nej. Yes, let's celebrate winter time. What's your goal? One minute. How was it? I don't know yet. <laughs> Swim. We're all gonna get wet tonight. An American. Alright man. What's your goal, dude? My goal? You did one minute? One minute. My goal is two minutes. Oh! Go on, man. I believe in you. Yeah, man. Yes! Yeah, I'm deploy the Adoid. Oh, no, I'm not. You have the time. Yeah, two minutes there. Good job. How does it feel? Good. Snart är det David. 15 sekunder, sen har du... Shit. Är det sant? 3 minuter? Nej, 4. Det är ganska länge. Ja, men du... 5 minuter ska du vara i. Ja, det är väl 4 grader. Nu är det kort. Nu är det kort. Är det 5 minuter? Jajamän. 5 minuter. Yeah! There you go. Bra där. Ja, precis. Det är starkt alltså! Det är roligt rekord! Åh jävlar! 3 minuter 
<laughs> How do you feel? Great. Om du kan linda in mig en varm pizza. Bra basti. Birthday boy. Birthday boy. He's going inside in the best sunset we ever seen here today. Let's do this! Mother Nature gave you this body, and you are strong. You can do this. You're doing excellent. You've done it once before. Yeah, one time. But uh, I was screening, top of my lungs. Really? Yeah, I panicked. Like, yeah, I was the first one in. I never uh -huh. saw anyone do that, so uh -huh. I just jumped in and then I, my lungs emptied over there and I couldn't like do anything except for get up. What are you going to do this time to change it? Um, I'm going to watch David and try to like maintain my breathing. Deep breaths, just trying to focus and uh, yeah, take it for where it is. Nice. Do you think you're going to do better this time? I hope so. Do you want to? I do. Okay. Okay. Tack för mig. Tack för att Tack för den. Tack för att En ut år till. Ett år till. Grattis. Tack. Vi är nöken. Hey everybody, I'm filming this update from the Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. I'm headed back to America. I've been working behind the scenes on something super exciting. I'm gonna be building an Earthship and documenting the entire process from dirt to doorknob. It's a tiny, super efficient Earthship. So it's an Earthship tiny house. That's it for me, I have to go catch my flight. All right, I arrived in Taos and uh, today was the first day on the build site. Monumental occasion. We pounded the first course of tires, which is always a feather in the cap uh, to be a part of the foundation of the building. Very satisfying, hard work, uh, hot sun, but we even had a little bit of rain during the middle of the day and some clouds that came and gave us some shade. Not too bad, but I tell you, I'm going to be sleeping good tonight. Part of the process today that's so tedious and what makes the first day of tire pounding uh, so laborious is that you really need to take the time to make the foundation perfect. You want the building to be square. You want all your tires to be sitting exactly where they're going to be because they're 300 pounds once they're pounded and you don't want to move them after that. I have an idea of the site. You know, we've got a trailer with all our tools in it and some solar panels on top and we're going to be able to run some power tools with that. It's awesome. Uh, you don't always get that on a work site, so we're looking really good. And then we have a uh, shade area that they've created over here. They've built a awning and they're going to be putting some shade tarps over that so that we have a shady area to work in during these hot days in the full sun. Ron has the cooling tubes that just got welded at the shop sitting here in his trailer uh, ready for installation when it's time. And today the main objective was to pound the north face uh, tire wall because the back of the building is going to be receiving the cooling tubes which are going to come under the ground. They're gonna pop up out of the ground and then they're gonna be sitting on that first row of tires. So the objective for today was to get those tires set, level, pounded. That way we can install the cooling tubes next. So there's a lot of steps. Some of these steps already took place before I got here and I was able to pick Ron's brain. He left the black water and the leach field cells open and the septic tank exposed so that I could see that. Um, in order to document that part of the build, which was awesome. You know, it feels uh, like everything fell into place so that I could be here at this moment. And uh, I'm really excited and ready to produce some high quality content for everybody. Okay, everybody, it's day two on the job site and we're getting rained out. So we're covering up the tires. A little bit of moisture in the dirt would have been nice, but Getting this much rain in the tires at this point wouldn't be great because it would be like mud taking off for the day. Day two in the books, Prius camper on site, off-grid guru out. Okay, so behind me is the construction site for an Earthship tiny house that is underway. 
I've been posting updates and I wanted to show everyone what this house will look like when it's completed. We've been trying to get in touch with the owner of the tiny house that Ron built and sold already, which is right behind the camera person here. And so we're about to take a walk through essentially what this building is gonna look like once it is completely finished. Let's go check this out. So it's really not that far away. In fact, it's within, uh, within eyesight of the other build here. All right, come on in. So as you can see, there's a lot more color on this uh, building than it makes out right now while it's under construction. The whole front face is gonna be plastered and then uh, tinted with a green stain. Uh, some of the details on the front face, like the mullion caps that go over the windows are clearly visible now, which are the metal caps that are screwed down onto the windows here. Um, the green flashing on the top, and some exterior lamps and electrical details as well as most differently uh, that you don't see on the build right now is these uh, planter cells that are in the front of the building. Now we're going to catch up with Ron and the crew who had already gone inside. Ron is going to talk about some of the details in this house that are going to be the same and also changes that we're going to make for the future. We started the tour in the greenhouse. So what you have right now is you've got a banana tree, you got uh, rubber tree, you got purple jew, uh, there's geranium in here. You always want to put geranium inside of your planter. It's a, it's a good companion plant, but it's also a bug repellent. Uh, you can get aphids and mites and uh, some heavy predators that can come in here and decimate a, a planter pretty easily, especially with uh, not having a full-time homeowner here to manage the system. So this space, even though it was like probably high 20s this morning, this space is going to be pushing about 90 uh, all day long. Yeah, it's almost uncomfortably warm. It is. Uh, it can get to about 140 degrees. Uh, if those blinds were all the way open, this little eight-foot space uh, would be on fire. You can see that the plants are struggling. A lot of them are already really dry and struggling from the direct heat from the sun. So again, it needs a lot of water. It's probably very thirsty, and who knows what gray water is even available to these plants. At this point, I would start top watering them uh, pretty quickly if they want them to last uh, through the winter, which is the time where they get beat up the most. The crew is here to study the design that they would end up building themselves. So we took a look inside at the living space. Uh, it's going to be the same in terms of like the way the pitch of the ceiling is. All your cabinets are all going to be homemade by my crew. It's going to have the same kitchen layout. Uh, they do want a larger refrigerator. They're going to do something different down here. We're not going to put a bar. We are going to have the cool spice rack, which is really slick. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, storage in kitchens. I've been in the restaurant business since I was seven years old. So I really know how to build kitchens. This kitchen was actually designed to be even slicker. I had built a bar and it was on casters and it had dowel plugs. And you could make it level right here with two bar stools. And then it was designed to spin to basically right here for an additional food prep area. And then it clicked down again and it slipped back here to the Bonco. So you could, you could eat here. And the Murphy bed I designed had a built-in couch and drawers. It was a one-of-a-kind. Both of these were one-of-a-kind. We made them custom here on site. But the new owner I sold it to, they, they didn't want any use of it. So we'll put them in the new building. There'll be way more space also with the new building. This is only 12 feet. Uh, the new one's 14 feet. And the greenhouse is actually going to be a little bit bigger as well. So you get a little bit more food production that's going to happen in it. That's going to be in the closet now. Right, because I didn't screw it up and make my closet too small. So these breaker panels right here, these are your DC panels. This is your AC panel. Uh, basically, if there's a problem with them and they spark, you've got to have 36 inches space of clearance to move away from it. We had 32. 
<clears throat> so as a result, we were going to fail the electrical inspection, uh, and I can't risk that. So we ended up deciding at the last minute, okay, we're going to put it here. We'll leave that as a closet for cleaning supplies because, again, it was an Airbnb. It was a perfect fit. It ended up working. And then we put the AGM batteries underneath. So in the end, there have been many changes made to the new design, which we're currently working on. One of the big changes was an increase in the size of the floor plan in the bathroom. While the old design only accounted for a small shower cabin, the new design allows for an entire tub. Well, that's it for the tour. I hope it gave you a better idea of what we're building and what it's going to look like when it's finished. As for us, we're going back to work. Behind me, I've got a construction site that we've been working hard on all week. It's been on my bucket list to build on one of these job sites professionally, and I am here now today doing that. Anyways, for the next three months, I'm going to be posting updates. This is week one for you. Nice hot summer day. Smoke coming down into the Taos Valley the last several days. So I'm a little hoarse, a little scratchy. Okay, so today my number one focus is layout. So we wanna get the interior dimensions of the square footage of the home based on the architectural plans. What we're really focused on is this right here today. Um, we wanna make sure that these 490s are accurate. So when we bring our tires all the way down the back wall, we're also gonna establish what they call a three tire turn right here. Cause tires are round, and these corners are curved, we're gonna place a tire right on top of this stake. So we're gonna go right through the crosshairs, right down through the center of the tire. We want our interior measurement based on course one or also known as base course. Then we're gonna start coming up as we batter back. So the room will feel bigger as we go up. As we pound all the tires, we're gonna pound the tire level to itself and level to each other on either side. So we wanna pound 38 tires. We're going with the bigger tires, pretty much all of them. And then we're gonna to go to smaller tires. But after all this brain work is out of the way, it goes quick. It's just now muscle work. All right, so it's day six on the job. I'm really tired. Sometimes it can feel like the build goes really slow just because of the technique we're using. You know, rammed earth and old used car tires, it's not for everybody. Even though tires might not be the most effective way to build, you can streamline them once you get the hang of it. And the more experience that you get in any building medium, the more effective it becomes and the more quick it goes up. You know, you understand how to use the material, the limits of the material. You know, one of the things that I've been noticing about tire pounding and one of the things that we've been doing is um, minimizing on the amount of uh, using the sledgehammer. You know, in the beginning, it seems like, okay, let's just sledgehammer the whole way. And then after a while, you get smart and you're like, okay, let me first use my hands to pack it as much as I can. And then I developed this really effective technique of just going around and using the pickaxe to get leverage so that I could push dirt under the sidewalls. And you can pretty much puff up the tire to a pretty good firmness before you even need to use the sledgehammer. And then, I mean, I'm talking like 90%, you know, 90% of packing out the tire is just shoveling the dirt in, kicking it in, you know, using some minimal force, maybe a small hammer, but I didn't even use a small hammer. I just used my feet, kicked it in, used the pickaxe to get the sidewall up. And then just in the end, when you want to level it to the tire next to it, you're going to get that sledgehammer to give it a little bit of pop so that it comes up that extra quarter inch or half inch you need. Anyways, we'll see how it goes. Maybe I'll be complaining after another week of tire pounding. <laughs> you know, we got two cooling tubes in, which is going to be the ventilation for the building. So those trenches were dug and the cooling tubes were put in. The cooling tubes are fully buried at this point, so you can't even see them. You just have the opening here and 
the opening over there. Found some cool animals while we were working out here. There was like a small frog that was really weird. I didn't expect it because it's such a desert. And then also this really big mole cricket came by and said hello. And those things are huge. If you haven't seen them, Google mole cricket. They're so big. So week three, we have uh, almost the fifth course of tires done. We'll probably have that done tomorrow. Not bad. All right, so today we're talking thermal wrap on the Earthship. Um, basically, I wanted to show you the process that can make it easier to understand how to wrap your Earthship in insulation. Uh, this is the part, this is the, the single part that people mess up consistently uh, when they try to DIY their own house and they just don't understand why you need to do the thermal wrap in a particular, very meticulous uh, way with no leaks and no gaps so that you have the maximum efficiency of thermal battery in your house. So that's a lot of gobbledygook. You probably didn't understand what I meant right there, but I'm gonna turn the camera over, uh, take a look at the wall and explain it, and then it'll all make sense. So basically in the Earthship, you want to keep the heat inside the building. And so you're burying panes of insulation in the ground, which are getting wrapped double ply in, is it 10 mil? I forget. The insulation is, uh, the plastic is quite thick. Uh, is this eight mil? Ron, what's the plastics mil? Six. Okay, so we got six mil doubled and then wrapped over this uh, sheet of expanded polystyrene, which is basically just foam. We're burying it on both sides. And usually when you're building an airship with a crew of laborers and you don't have an excavator, then what you would do is you'd build up layer by layer and you'd be backfilling on either side, making sure that this is level as you go up. Uh, in this event, we had an excavator, which won't change much what I'm explaining for you, but it just does uh, explain for you why we're able to complete this task, wrapping the entire building in maybe one day. Johnny's coming in like a beastie boy. We are wrapping it up today, no pun intended. It's official in the books, week three. The thermal wrap for the first four feet of the building is up, not bad. We're gonna be putting some cisterns in tomorrow. Today is a big day on the job. We're gonna be trying to finish up the final course of tires, making one last push to get that top course set and pounded. And then after that, we can start working on getting our plates ready so that we can bond the framing to the tires, which is a big moment. So after the tires on the top course are finished and we put the plate down, we're gonna be completely finished with the foundation work uh, of the building, including uh, pouring the grade beam, uh, pouring the bond beam. Um, so this week, we hope to have all the steel ready for the inspection by the end of the week. So this is a pretty big one. Uh, after this, things aren't gonna be looking the same. Behind me, I have the Tiny Plus Earthship build. I'm coming at you from Taos, New Mexico. This is the gravel pit in the greater world Earthship community. It's the largest Earthship community in the world, and it's where Mike Reynolds has been experimenting, as well as many other owner builders out here on the Mesa, uh, building off-grid homes, radically off-grid homes that capture their own rainwater, grow their own food, contain and treat their own sewage. They're heated with uh, passive thermal mass principles, and they're just incredible. So we've been working on this project now for <laughs> We're talking six weeks, so we're getting into the month and a half of just pounding tires. We are exhausted and cranky, and it has been a really difficult run up until this point. But we have hit a crucial point in the build where it's going to take a radical turn. We've finished the foundational walls. We've poured the concrete. What Ron is now walking into is a structure that can receive essentially all of the carpentry details, which are going to enclose the space for the winter, for the weather. Once we get a weather guarded roof up, we are going to be dried in. So he's going to talk a little bit more about it, but the man, the myth, the legend, Ron Shirillo himself in the flesh. Woo! His voice is finally back because yes. uh, the wildfires came in and the smoke just destroyed his lungs. When I first came here, he, could bear, he was whispering. Yeah. Now this man is screaming and we just got through a week that was really tough, had a lot of unexpected twists, a lot of manual labor. We're exhausted, but it's satisfying. Yes. Yeah, Eric's right. Um, stage one and two are brutal.
especially with a skeleton crew. We had to pound about 500 tires out here. Most days were in the low 90s. So yeah, as Eric mentioned, you know, that, that phase is done. Thank goodness. We are in late September. I am expecting the weather to start cooling off and start getting our pace picked up, which is gonna be crucial to get it weathered in. Uh, stage two was concrete and uh, steel. So the, all the footings are done. The bond beam footing is signed off by the county. Grade beam is signed off by the county. Uh, we're prepped for the grounding rod, which she would have signed off for me as well, but we weren't quite ready. Uh, that'll be signed off on the next inspection. So now we're gonna move into phase three. It's a shift in the build cost. So up until now, it's been all going into Eric's pocket. No, I'm just kidding. It's labor, it's all labor. Uh, tires are free, dirt's free, uh, cardboard's free, you know, all that stuff's been free up till now. Concrete and steel, they've still been reasonably priced. They really didn't spike uh, during the pandemic like a lot of other things did. But now we're in phase three, which is all about carpentry. So carpentry is gonna be plating, a lot of plating, which we've already gotten into. Uh, concrete stem pour for under the windows. So those are lifted off the floor. So those are prepped. Uh, then we're gonna start getting into the fun stuff. Uh, I hope it's gonna be fun because up till now, not much has been fun. Uh, we're gonna get into the window boxes, door bucks, and then we're gonna get into the plating on top of all that. So I'm really gonna push hard next week to you know get all of that framing going up into the sky, coming off, to the ground, off the ground, up to the sky, and then we can do our plating and then we're ready to start dropping the roof down on it. The timing's really crucial now. We're gonna be moving into October here next week. We could get a snowstorm. We could still see 90 degrees. It's all over the place. I'm gonna move all the guys together. My entire crew is gonna be single-minded, tunnel vision focused on weatherproofing this building. And hopefully everybody's ready. Eric and I are pretty tired. We're going to be crawling in on, on our knees. <laughs> on Monday. On Monday. Oh, my God. Um, on Monday. Um, yeah. I mean, Well, we made it through the week. And let's take a, let, let's take a look at what we've done. Let's come just on walk. in. You got to see this. Check it out. Okay. We rolling? We're rolling. Are we? We're back in business. Okay. So welcome into my home. Normally, I charge an admission fee, but I'm going to let you in for free today since it's a little rough. <laughs> So what you have here is 700 square feet of awesomeness. <laughs> <laughs> this house is gonna like sing. It, this, I'm really excited about this. Uh, after 16 years of really R&D, and every, every day with our ship is R&D. Uh, it's even nice. after it's done and you're living in it. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're looking at it like, ooh, I probably should have not done that. Mm -hmm. We're trying not to have a lot of that, but that is gonna be the case with every airship. There's only gonna be a couple guys on earth that are even gonna know what those are. The people that are buying a house, moving into it, they're gonna not notice a thing. They're gonna love it, it's gonna love them. We're into phase three now. So again, tires, thermal wrap, vapor barrier, water tanks, cooling tubes, pack out, that's phase one. Phase two, grade beam, bond beam, signed off from the county, all that concrete and steel inspection, all completed. Now we're moving into phase three. As Eric mentioned, this is gonna be plating. So there's plating right here on the stem wall, plating on top of the grade beam, plating on top of the concrete little mini stem pours, plating on top of the bond beam. It's a lot of plating. So, and that's all pressure treated, waterproofed, because it's sitting directly either on tires or on concrete. Yeah, so we're talking about a lot of pores. So how many cubic yards of concrete do you think we mixed? So I'd say we have about three yards of concrete in our footings. Quite a bit. For a skeleton crew and two mixers by hand, uh, you know, I'm not saying that uh, it can't be done. I know a lot of guys probably would have ordered a truck. Uh, the problem with trucks is that they want a minimum yard. Uh, typically it's about five yards. There's a delivery charge. Uh, there's a fuel charge. There's a tax charge. And by the time it's all said and done, here's what I would prefer. See this man's pocket? I put that money right in there. Ding. To me, that's more important than paying the guys to come out with a big truck 
So 30 yards is uh, cubic yards. Three cubic yards. Yeah, three, th sorry. That would have been a truck. Too many beers, yeah. yeah that would have been a truck. 30 cubic yards would have been a truck. <laughs> This will never look the same as the way it does right now where the roof is open. Once this thing is enclosed, it will forever be a dried in structure that's weatherproof, that can survive the winter, that's keeping you dry. You could technically, if there was no uh, requirements for a certificate of occupancy from the county, you could live in the structure as soon as you get dried in, correct? This is true. You, uh, you know, if you're one of those people that trying to do it, you know, out of pocket, using trash, trying to avoid having a mortgage. Um, you know, you don't want to pay rent or a mortgage somewhere else. It gets a little tricky. Yes, there are some pockets of freedom areas around the United States as well as around the planet. Uh, if you're in a pocket of freedom or a reservation or some place where they don't have code, yeah, the minute I get it roughed in, I'm living in it. Uh, Camping stove, absolutely. <laughs> hammocks. I, yeah, I mean, right. So we're yeah. it's rustic, but you're out of the elements. You know, you're not you're not dealing with the bugs. Let's get out into the sun and walk up on the top. Check the mic and make sure it sounds right, boys. Are we rolling? You can see the can form. It's a mortar mix, no concrete. It's not load bearing. I made sure it was 10 inches high and basically a 10 inch uh, ID interior dimension for this bond beam pour. So what we did was a couple days, we w went ahead and used all these aluminum cans, which is really important for us here in Taos County. Uh, Friday before last, Taos County decided to close its recycling center, which is really unfortunate because it took people a long time to get fully trained to start rinsing and separating and then driving all the way down to the recycling center and putting it in the proper bins. And, and so now all of a sudden that's gone, which hopefully is not forever. But for right now, uh, we used up, you know, a few thousand cans, uh, not just in the pack out, but in the bond beam. It's important to me to see something good happen where as right now it's going into the landfill. The biggest mistake people make when they're building earthships or any structure of this kind that they think, oh, it's going to be a hobbit house, it's going to be buried underground, any type of burying your house underground, even for the foundation of a conventional structure, which you then put a stick frame on top of a poured concrete foundation, you can mess this detail up and significantly uh, impair your ability to warm and cool your structure passively. This is super crucial. This is a make it or break it moment for you as an owner builder. If you mess this up, you're going to have a huge problem keeping the temperature of this space comfortable and are probably going to be burning some kind of fuel source and have failed. For those of you who know, who know how a passive thermal heat storage system works, this is what Ron is referring to. We are talking about not only passive solar, but also the structure itself absorbing temperature. And so, you know, we have almost, I would say, on this build, what do you think that is? Five feet, five four feet, feet five, five feet. feet. So we have five feet of battery because the walls are thermal mass. They're made of tires. And so they absorb temperature. They transmute uh, temperature just like brick walls or rock walls or concrete walls. Uh, I'm looking at a big concrete bomb beam right here, which is thermal mass. I'm looking at dirt, which continues all the way down to the foundation of the building. This is all dirt here. And then now this is actually the perimeter of the uh, thermal wrap, which makes this into a thermal battery. Now there's also going to be insulation here too. You cannot have a thermal break. You've got R20 coming all the way up from below down at subgrade. But now we've got to capture this so we don't let this outside air temperature or snow or rain or anything change the temperature of the battery. The battery has to still sit at about 55 degrees. And right now, if I was the thermal probe, this burial right here, just in front of this insulation in plastic, I would find that temperature be pretty stable. Probably a little bit warmer, just because it's still been pretty hot, low 80s. So I'd have to dig down pretty deep in order to find that high 50, 60 degree temperature, but it's there. That's a fact. That's gonna be there, and I need to keep it there because October is coming next week. Then November, December, temperatures are not gonna get much over 40 degrees for several months. So this insulation blanket 
has to be captured pretty much right away. So before anything charges it in a negative temperature way or with water, I'm really thinking about this insulation in the skirting detail while the boys are starting to think about phase three of framing. You know, I've been holding this <laughs> microphone on this beer the whole time. Well, Josh, the beer mic. Beer. The beer <laughs> mic. I, I invented classic. the beer mic, but I couldn't drink because if I did this, it would make a sound like. <laughs> So it's Friday morning before the job. This week we've been getting the framing up and today we're going to be probably putting up some of the first roof rafters here. Usually Ron has a group meeting. Uh, we go over what we're gonna do for the day and I thought that I could give you guys a look inside what that's like. Uh, a day in the life of an Earthship build. Last week's update I interviewed Ron and we talked a little bit about some of the foundational details and told you what we were going to be doing this week and this week all the framing has gone up so now you can start to see what this building is going to look like when it's going to be completed with glass and metal flashing so things are getting exciting all right guys so here we are at the end of another work week uh, we're aggressively moving through phase three of 11. phase three in the middle of october is extremely important so I had one of my carpenters build the window boxes in his workshop. So they all came out perfect. We pounded all our stem wall tires, three courses, leveled them really well, put a vapor barrier in, and then we put our plates on top of that, ready to receive that perfectly dialed window boxes. I did do an oversized front door because there's gonna be a lot of gardening happening inside of this greenhouse. So I actually have it where you can bring a wheelbarrow in without smashing all the framing. <clears throat> We have our plates on the top that's ready to receive the greenhouse roof. Uh, I don't know if we're gonna get to it today. We are ready uh, with materials here with the two by 12s. We're gonna put 27 of them up there. Before all that, we want to talk about the skylights. <clears throat> so when we're doing the framing for this front greenhouse, we want to prep for the boxes that are going to actually go over the 2x12s. It's a detail that a lot of people are like questioning, but for strength and for approval for the framing inspection, we let them run all the way through. We put the box on top. So when you look up, you do see framing inside of the skylight box, but that's where you can hang your cam cleat and run your ropes. So I like it for stability, especially with high winds out here. It locks down that, that big box and that heavy lid, you know, a little tighter to that greenhouse roof. Inside the exterior greenhouse is the interior greenhouse. Same details, very meticulous carpentry for your window boxes, your door buck, your pony walls. Your pony walls are going to typically receive plumbing and electrical. So I didn't really explain that to my crew. They just kind of made it happen. Now it's gonna make more sense on the back end for them. It's not just a matter of getting the framing up to receive plates and then the lamy beam. The laminated beam is basically liquid nails and screws and ring shanks and you basically sandwich a bunch of two bys together to establish the height of where the roof line is actually gonna be kind of finished. So those projections off the lamy beam come up to the front greenhouse and to the back where the bond beam connects to it. All right. Now, another important thing when it comes to an earthship is the tires turn out up front. So what we did was, and this was also filmed in an earlier session, where we porcupine all the framing and then we come up with cans and cement mortar to actually grip it to the tire wall. It's the bond beam of framing to the tires in this way. So we've shown you earlier how you tie in a bond beam to the tires. 
and now the plating's up there. So one thing that the crew needs to know before we get too excited and finish up the Lamy beam and jump on TJIs, because that's what we want to do. We want to try to weatherproof this thing in. So when the weather changes, we have weather on Sunday, we have more weather coming in on Tuesday. We want to try to get under roof as quickly as we can so we don't shut the job down and we're able to work every day till the finish line. The next thing that has to happen is we have a plate that's locked down to the bond beam concrete and steel pour. On top of that is another plate. That plate is the sandwich plate. That sandwich is going to come off and we're going to slip in an EPDM. It's a rubber liner. It's ethylene propylene diene monomer. It's 45 mil. It's the thickness of a credit card one and a half. So it's really, really strong, really durable. We're also using it as a radon barrier in the house. So there's already two rooms already have radon barriers underneath the building. We'll get into more of that a little bit later. So we want to sandwich the EPDM in. That way the thermal battery, the tires, essentially the entire body of the building is waterproof now. So even if we got dumped with snow or rain, it has a way to shed away far enough that we don't concern ourselves with a capillary effect. The capillary effect would only happen if the dirt got wet and it just sucks it back in towards the back of the tires and eventually inside of the tires themselves and then ultimately into the tire wall on the inside. No bueno. We really want to waterproof this building. For those who've already been watching, you know that we have just begun the process of weatherproofing the building before the unpredictable rainy, windy, and snowy weather starts. As for now, I'm going to show you how we built the roof on the tiny house Earthship. Uh, this is an example of the roof from the tiny house in the beginning of the video, and it gives you an idea of what we're going to be building on the tiny house we're working on currently. So here's a preview of the roofing video, and be sure to check it out when I release the full version if you're interested in all the details. Where we left off last week, we had just finished framing the greenhouse, and we're about to install the roof rafters. Putting up the roof rafters is the very first step to insulating and waterproofing the structure. Once it is completed, we can begin working on the inside, protected from the elements. Many have asked me about roofing alternatives for earthships, which is why I'm extra excited to show you this detail. With the price of lumber increasing due to supply chain issues caused by COVID-19, these manufactured lumber trusses are a no-brainer in the current economic landscape. And unlike the excessive telephone poles used as roof rafters in the earthships of old, designed by Mike Reynolds, the manufactured joists that we are using on this build are a much more efficient use of material. Their lightweight design allows them to be carried by two people, and you could effectively install the roof in one weekend with a friend. Not only does their design use less wood, but it allows for the polyiso insulation panels to be sandwiched between the trusses. We broke into teams to tackle the task. One team was laying out the trusses and the other preparing the insulation panels. The layout plan for the trusses is 16 inch on center. After doing the math, Alan and Johnny decided to start installing from the middle, working their way out from east to west end. This part of the process lays the foundation for every detail that follows, and they must be precise now to avoid big mistakes later. Once they set the first rafters, however, the rest goes relatively quickly. Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. Once the last rafter was set, we realized that we were going to be short one. So instead of waiting a week for a delivery, I decided to take things into my own hands. So I fabricated a 20 foot long, 14 inch tall, laminated truss on site using 2x4s, 2x12s, and some glue and some metal plates and nails. I didn't end up filming the process, it was late in the day in the evening when I made it, but it involved a lot of clamps. The glue had dried overnight by the time we were trying to hoist it up the ladder, and this was probably the riskiest part. I was confident that the 
rafter would hold up once it was installed, but getting it there was kind of the issue. It was a lot heavier than the manufactured trusses that we had purchased, uh, but we managed to make it work. Josh and I had been preparing 16 inch wide panels of polyiso to be inserted into the trusses. We had to gear up with respirators just to be able to cut the foam, which is full of microscopic glass fibers. It's a very itchy situation, and you certainly don't want to breathe in the fiberglass dust that clouds around the saw. And here's the dust from a different angle. For those of you who have been watching closely, we said in a previous video that the insulation in this house would be made of recycled textile, which would have increased the R value to 100. However, that material recently went out of production, so we had to go with plan B. We ended up stacking three pieces of 3 inch thick polyiso foam board in the cavity. The resulting 9 inches of foam will have an R value of 78, a number that surpasses our benchmark for performance. In fact, it still surpasses Energy Star's recommended R value of 50 to 60 for the attic of a house built in the coldest climate zones in the United States of America. Unfortunately, that's as far as I got editing the roof video, so that's all you're going to see for now. Next, we're going to be installing the rim joist, laying plywood, putting the ice and water guard, and then doing the metal roofing. So there's a lot of juicy details coming up. Stay tuned for the roofing video if you want to see how everything comes together. Unfortunately, Johnny won't be here to finish the roof with us. He's leaving for Florida, so goodbye, Florida man. Safe travels. But I didn't want Johnny to leave without building the Earthship model kit, so I busted out a copy, and Johnny had a lot of fun putting it together. For those of you who don't know, Earthship model kit is the independent study project that I did for the Earthship Academy, where I took everything I learned and made a scaled-down version of a real Earthship with a accurate floor plan of a 900 square foot studio home. The high quality full color die cut model includes 12 pieces that make it easy to assemble the architecturally accurate model. It comes with easy to understand instructions and a 32 page full color informational guide that teaches you the six principles that make Earthship some of the most sustainable buildings in the world. Last week was roofing week, and in last week's update, we had just started the roof by putting up the rafters and the insulation. Then we began installing the plywood. Unlike the roof on the first tiny house that Ron built, this house has only two penetrations in the roof where the hot air will escape from the greenhouse through the vent box openings. So we cut a hole in the plywood where the vent boxes will be installed. Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. For those of you who've been watching, you might have remembered that we left an EPDM skirt vapor barrier draped outside the house perimeter. Because the north roof is hanging over the exposed ground, we need to create a barrier between the ground and the wood of the roof so that we don't get rot in the future. And all of that is capped with a metal drip edge as we transition now into waterproofing the plywood and putting the metal roof on. With the drip edge installed, we began rolling out the bitchethane waterproofing membrane. Right, boys. With the waterproofing membrane installed and the vent box openings framed and cut, it was time to install the classic Earthship Green water harvesting safe metal roof.
working in the Windy Mesa never leaves a dull moment on the job site. We worked until the sun went down and the moon came out. In regards to the roof, what you just saw, that was the easy part. A quality roof is in the small details. And I think I'm going to save those for another video. This video picks up where we left off in the last update, having just finished installing the metal roofing and glass on the Earthship Tiny House. It also included an awesome live demo with Ron, filled with pro tips on glass installation, so if you missed out on that, there's a link in the description. Like I said in last week's video, there are a ton of intricate metal details required to get this roof over the finish line, and in this video, I don't intend to cover all of them. There is so much more I would like to cover inside the house as we begin to work on the exciting finishing touches. But let me know if that's something you would like to see more of in the comments below, and if there is enough interest, I'll make a dedicated series covering metal roofing. But for now, here's a brief overview. Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. We began by insulating and waterproofing the east and west walls. and the vent box openings. Then we installed metal flashing over the vapor barrier in the areas that are going to be buried. This protects the foam insulation from the elements, including any critters that might want to chew through the walls. The gutters were fabricated on site and installed on the north side. We connected them to the cisterns in preparation for harvesting rainwater and snow melt. Meanwhile, on the front face, we flashed the facade around the doors and above the windows, fabricating the custom pieces on site with our 12-foot metal bender, also known as a brake. Having access to a brake makes metalwork much more adaptable. Instead of relying entirely on prefabricated pieces, you can buy flat stock and make anything you need. Around the windows, we waterproofed the remainder of the exposed wood with an adhesive membrane. We were nervous working around the windows, knowing that it's a delicate process and accidents can always happen. In the end, we weren't able to prevent the inevitable and ended up breaking a pane of glass anyways. Even though tempered glass can withstand direct impacts on its face, one blow to the edge or corner can shatter the entire pane. In this case, it was a blow to the edge of the glass with the stapler that led to the carnage. Now let's watch that again in slow-mo. It sound right, boy. This set us back slightly when it came time to install the mullion caps, a frame of thick metal that waterproofs the windows. Once the mullion caps are set, the windows are sealed. However, with the pane broken, we had to wait to finish the job. In the meantime, I worked on building and installing the operable vent box lids, and I could make a whole video just about that, but for now, here's the short version. We cut the foam and added a 2x4 where the hinges will connect. To the bases. Then we wrapped the bases in sheet metal and began fabricating the lids. The lids are framed and insulated with a layer of metal flashing on the underside. This helps shed moisture that builds up on the inside of the lid from the humidity in the greenhouse as hot air rises. 
I wrap the outside of the box in a waterproofing membrane and then metal flashing. The lid is designed to have a basket on the backside which you can fill with weights so that it opens by itself without motors or gearboxes. One opens the vent from the inside using a rope that hangs down in the greenhouse. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so it works out. But moving back to the front face, the broken window was finally replaced and we were able to install the mullion caps. An unforgiving process in which each plate of metal is glued down to the glass with a thick bead of tar putty called butyl tape. There are no second chances. Once the frame is set, you can't peel it off, unless you really f***ed up. We took our time and everything went smoothly. Stepping back at the end of the day, our work looked great. The next day, it was time to hang the door. A triumphant moment to be a part of. A moment that marked measurable progress. A moment that stood out from the daily grind and became a measurement of how far we had just come. From dirt to doorknob. Literally. Our journey started in a pile of dirt, and after months of hard work, we just installed the doorknob. Well, that's it for this video, but don't worry, there's plenty more work to be done. And as always, I'll be here to keep you up to speed as we move inside and start making this house a home. And that was the last update that I posted from the field in Taos. After that, I left the crew to go enjoy the holidays with my family. And over New Year's, I celebrated the one year anniversary of the channel. And it's incredible to think that this channel started in November of 2020, when I was in quarantine editing the documentary Earthships in Pennsylvania, which is the first of my videos to get over 100,000 views. Check it out. And for the premiere of this channel, I'm going to be releasing a series of videos covering the documentation of a radical architectural movement emerging in Pennsylvania. For the next two months, I'm going to be releasing interviews, home tours, and a full-length documentary. I'll be introducing you to a community of trailblazers whose alternative ideas have resulted in the construction of three unique and inspirational structures. To start telling this story, I'd like to take you on a trip down memory lane and show you some photos from a time before I was filming my life for the off-grid guru. Well, when I got to Pennsylvania, it turned out that there were actually two projects. The first one was a restoration project where we were going to rebuild an existing greenhouse. And the second was a groundbreaking standalone structure near Philadelphia. This Earthship inspired greenhouse was the first of its kind in America to be built within the city limits. In this video, I'm going to be taking a look back on the restoration project that we did at Stonehenge Gardens in Tamaqua, Pennsylvania. The first thing I noticed when I arrived at Stonehenge was the peaceful atmosphere, the beautiful lakes, waterfalls, and also a really interesting stone orb that was in the garden when you first entered. After taking a look around, I immediately noticed a greenhouse that had fallen into disrepair over the years. It was so obvious that this is the project that we were going to be working on. It already looked like an earthship, it just needed a new life brought to it, so we immediately started putting some love into the structure by removing the ugly moss-covered panes of plastic and then tearing down the aluminum frame, giving us a clear slate to build from. With the opportunity to excavate a channel for the gray water botanical cell before we started closing in the structure, it was just an ideal time to do the digging and really saved a lot of sweat and man hours to be able to just have an excavator come. We couldn't tell that there was a gravel floor in the old greenhouse until we started digging, at which point it revealed that there was about a foot of gravel underneath for drainage, so that was great.
This is probably my favorite moment of the entire build when Lauren discovered that we had pounded the first tires. She was so surprised. You know, tire pounding is something that I'm just so used to after having done the Earthship Academy, but of course it's uh, pretty strange for most people who've never seen it. So when we started pounding the first tires at the greenhouse build here, it was a really monumentous occasion. The co-owner of Stonehenge Gardens, Tom, even came down and pounded a tire himself as well as uh, many, many more volunteers who came and helped us. This really labor-intensive process is actually an excellent way to reuse something that would normally just be thrown away in a landfill. By ramming earth into the tires, you form a structural block that can be used for the foundation and even the walls of a house. Because the construction of this tire wall started on either side and then met in the middle, when the tire wall met itself, there was an awkward space that was later filled with concrete in order to even out the foundation. A classic earthship building technique using cans and mortar was used in other awkward areas. The next step for the foundational wall after the tires was something called a bond beam, which connects all the tires together and also forms a stable and level surface for the framing to be built upon. Alright, so I know that it's a little hard to understand what we're doing here in the photos, so I just wanted to bring us over to the whiteboard and I could do a drawing. It'll be a lot easier to explain what we're doing and what we're trying to achieve. So we've already seen how we pounded a tire wall for the foundation of the greenhouse, but that's not where we're at yet. I'm just going to back us up a few steps to the beginning when we dug a trench. In this system, the idea is to minimize the amount of outside water that we have to bring in in order to water our plants. Instead, the design utilizes a rubber-lined planter bed which contains and treats water that was normally just flushed down the drain from the showers and sinks and instead is being reused one more time to water the plants in the greenhouse before it is finally flushed out into the septic field. So that's just a complicated way of saying that you're wasting less water because every time you take a shower, you're watering the plants in the greenhouse. Whenever you use the sink, you're watering the plants in the greenhouse. So this is just a system that is reusing the water that comes from the farmhouse. Before we installed the bond beam, I had uh, been tearing down some of the wood and discovered that there were termites, mostly because when I went inside and looked in the mirror, I could see them crawling in my hair. But anyways, it was a major setback. We had to wait for the exterminator to come, and then eventually we had to replace the studs and um, put some new sill plates up. And after that, we were ready to move on. Things started to really take shape once the framing was installed. By far, the trickiest part of the process was the angle. Um, it would have been much, much easier to have just done a vertical 90 degree face, but because this is a passive solar greenhouse, the angle is required to capture the winter sun. Well, it is Pennsylvania, so it ended up raining before we were able to get the roof closed in, and that actually proved to us that the gray water cell would hold water. That was great because it meant that there were no leaks, but it also meant that we were standing in water while we were working, so we ended up having to come up with some solutions to uh, pump the water out. You could feel the tension in the air the day that the glass was installed. If we had done everything correctly, each pane of glass should fit perfectly in the window frame with no effort. And that's exactly what they did. As each pane of glass was put in, the entire character of the building changed as the reflection on the surface of the glass grew, showing the sky above us. I stayed on the project for quite some time after that, but don't seem to have any photos. Unfortunately, that's as far as my documentation goes for this project. However, I was able to see the finished greenhouse when I returned in the fall of 2020. It was really incredible to just stand in the greenhouse so full of life, just taking a look around at the result of all of the hard work of all of the people that were involved in the project and really just getting a chance to come back and see uh, the fruit of our labor. Just looking down at the floor and the walls, knowing how much recycled material went into building this structure 
from the bricks in the floor to the glass bottles in the walls. They were all materials that were going to be thrown out that were given a second life inside the structure. Well, that was it for this video. I hope you liked it. Next video, we're going to be taking a look at Will Vogler's greenhouse in his backyard near Philadelphia, as well as a home tour of a residential earthship in Pennsylvania, and a full-length documentary, so if you don't want to miss out, then be sure to like and subscribe. I showed up in the backyard of Will Vogler, a family man who was determined to prove that alternative building techniques could work in Pennsylvania. Welcome, Eric. I'm really glad to be doing this with you here on site. How cool is that? Yeah, this is really inspirational and exciting. Uh, I just drove down from New York last week, three hours here to Pennsylvania. It's just outside of Philadelphia, so this is actually the first Earthship build within a major U.S. city, which is super exciting, which is going to push this really out into the mainstream and make it more accessible, more palatable for a lot of people. Uh, the first time I encountered Earthships was on family vacation. I rented one. Me and my family, I was about 14 years old, and I became super mega inspired by the fact that they were using recycled materials in these buildings, that there were palm trees growing inside, parakeets in the greenhouse. The whole thing was just absolutely mind-blowing for little 14-year-old me. And so I had my eyes dead set on learning how these things worked. And right now, I'm back on the ground here in Pennsylvania building this model, this greenhouse in someone's backyard. So it, it's just a great opportunity to be here and also to share this information, which I've turned from something that is really kind of hard to understand fr from the beginning for most people. You know, what you're telling me, you're taking garbage and building houses with it. You know, you're growing your own food inside. You're, you know, containing and treating your own sewage. You're capturing rainwater. You don't need any uh, air conditioners or heating systems to heat and cool your home. You're essentially not really paying any bills once the house is you know, constructed. So it's a little bit over the top to believe and it's a bit far out, but it's real and it's happening and it could be happening in your backyard and anyone can do it. You know, you can go off grid, you can be sustainable. There's a real on the ground movement that's happening in this day and age. I mean, it just so happened that my wife, she's a nutritionist, and so we had always been trying to uh, work with different um, greenhouses, growing our own food. It, it was struggling, you know, then we had to learn all about greenhouses and greenhouses have a short window of usefulness. And so our goal was to create something that we could use year, year round and an earthship type structure just made sense, you know, 60 to 70 degrees year round. In order to achieve this constant year round temperature, Half of Will's greenhouse is buried under the ground. In order to reuse as many recyclable materials as possible, the building material of choice for this greenhouse was old car tires rammed with dirt. This really labor-intensive process is actually an excellent way to reuse something that would normally just be thrown away in a landfill. By ramming earth into the tires, you form a structural block that can be used for the foundation and even the walls of a house. The first day at the Ambler build was definitely a memorable one. I don't know if I've ever pounded just absolutely wet mud into tires, but it's not fun. When things did eventually dry up, we were able to make some headway and get some work done on these walls. Will's son Dominic came out to help us and uh, it was really cute. We got Dominic here pounding his first tire. Dominic, what are you doing? Oh, he's going for the... <laughs> Good job, buddy. You need a level. You're going for the swing. In order to transition from the tire wall to framing the window boxes, a form was built that was reinforced with steel rebar and then concrete was poured in as well as some threaded rod that was pressed down into the form to create a level surface that we could later build the window boxes on top of.
Will had told friends and local bars what he was doing and had amassed a huge collection of old glass bottles. By cutting the bottles in half and taping them together, a brick is formed that one can use to make a bottle brick wall. Compared to pounding tires, this technique is a lot less labor intensive and can really get the whole team in a good spirit. This is the second way in which this greenhouse consumes something that would normally be thrown out. Well, my time with the project was up, so this was the last thing that I saw of the greenhouse. I took a few selfies and was on my way. Nikki Rhodes, who was able to stay for the finishing of this project, provided the documentation and videos that I'm about to show you now. Finishing this bottle wall, putting a final layer of concrete on. And then we're gonna clean it off, clean off all the bottles just like this to create that beautiful stained glass effect on the bottles. The lighting's horrible. <laughs> it's alright. So the bottoms are sticking out. Then he's gonna pack that. And eventually. I'm gonna start looking like this. That's it for this video, but the story doesn't end there. After the completion of the Earthship-inspired greenhouse, Will founded something called the Tamaqua Sustainability Project, when him and his father and a group of volunteers built an off-the-grid homestead and educational center in Pennsylvania. Up next, I'm going to be releasing a documentary, home tours, and interviews surrounding this inspirational project, so if that's something that interests you, then be sure to subscribe. In this video, I'd like to introduce you to Bill Vogler, a kind man with a big heart who is currently building an off-the-grid homestead in Pennsylvania. After his son Will built an Earthship-inspired greenhouse in his backyard, they decided to take the experiment to the next level. They decided to build a home that will free them from having to pay rent and utility bills every month. The house is still in mid-construction and they faced major setbacks due to COVID-19 in the year 2020. In this interview, Bill is going to share his story with all of us and take us on a tour around the work site of his future homestead. So you brought this all the way from Texas? Yeah. Uh, and then I went down by train and got, uh, I don't know how well, <laughs> it's been a while since I had it on, so. <laughs> Texas! <laughs> Lived in Galveston for a while, then Hitchcock for a while, which is just across the causeway. And then I was in Dickinson with this RV. All right. And uh, where we were was where uh, Harvey yeah. flooded everything. I have pictures of this van with the water all the way up to the windows. Oh jeez. And we just everything uh, you're kind of looking at is is pretty much new or in progress, because we got shut down uh, because of the coronavirus, and then May or June I just started working on it. So we just a couple of months ago got the trim on the front, and then uh, we tried to get this closed up. So that was like July, August. We put the windows in. Well, by putting the windows in, I made the frames. Okay, because that's. 20 some frames I had to make. And it takes about a day for each one of those. So you got 20 windows, it took a month. Yeah. All right, so then, uh, yeah, it'd be September, we stuck the windows in. Fortunately, they fit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, all yeah, kind of yeah, crooked. Yeah. 
So how long were you traveling before? Well, I left a week before Harvey came in, All right? But the year before, we were up here, uh, Poconos and like looking for land. Uh huh. And I brought this up and did a couple of the, the parks up here. So I kind of knew the area. And then uh, Will said, hey, you know, Tamaqua is allowing us to build these homes. <clears throat> I said, okay, and looked on the internet and there was this 18, 19 acres here. Uh huh. So I told him, I said, go up and look at it. So he, he liked it, so we bought it. <laughs> that was 2018? Two years ago. Yeah. 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 And then, uh, yeah, six months, he kept saying, come up, come up, come up. You know, they're finishing the thing at Stonehenge, and his is going to be done, and then mine will be next. So I finally came up. Yeah. yeah. We uh, went through all the problems with the, telling us that the land was uh, wetland. You couldn't have a road on it. We'd have to get special permission. That would take two or three years. Yeah. So you have to learn to play the game. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, this is Bill Vogler. Uh, this is my house. And we're going to take a look inside and see how far we've come. This is a coffin door, they call it. And uh, it'll have more decoration through here. It was just so heavy, I wanted to get it up now, and then I can decorate it. Uh, this is G. She is a uh, full bred collie out of Oklahoma. She drank all those beers. Yeah. <laughs> those bottles are for the wall, and people contribute. So, G. Yes. It's big G. You love this new. So we have a drain here. This is a mud room. Uh, it's uh, have the same kind of door. You can see we have the archway I was putting in, and the idea is that the air from the outside will only come into here. We close this door before we open that door. This is just part of that drain that's going to go across. Um, in, in the middle over there is where the septic system goes out. That's our bathroom. This is our first bedroom. Our supply room right now. So a little bit of everything there. This table has uh, well plywood on it, and the idea is it's perfectly flat to make doors. So you put your uh, plywood on here and screw it down, make sure everything's flat before you build your door. So, and then, of course, miter saw. Got to have a miter saw. Yeah, you don't have that, you're not going anywhere. And it gives you an idea of the view from up here. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had yellows and reds and greens. It was real pretty. They just turned brown overnight. Right, this is our, our bathroom, and, and you can see we've just put the pipe in there, and we have some uh, hole in the ground yet. So you just started doing the drain plumbing here? Right, yeah, we haven't put the water in it yet, and uh, we have a lot of parts. But I could actually run the washing machine, so if I put this in, then I can run the washing machine. The solar panels, because I don't have them on the front yet, uh, but you can see the wires coming in. And uh, somebody was wondering how difficult it is to uh, put your solar panels in. Uh, it's snap together technology. Okay, so you, you, they come right off the panel. You can buy an extender cable and you just put them together and then run them into the power inverter. Charge controller directly hooked into the uh, solar panels. And it has a picture of the solar panels. Solar panels, I am just laying on the roof. All right, uh, this is uh, six of them. But we have some other ones, like the white one up there is running the fans. That's all it took to run the fans. And then I have a couple I haven't hooked up. The, uh, there's a couple more down by the RV and the other van, and they're keeping the batteries hot. You know, so if I go down there and start that, that van, then I'll fire right up. 74, 78 volts, 101, you know, that's what's coming in. Now it pulses to charge the batteries, so you can see this up and down. But normally, in a, when the sun's out, that'll be like 25 or 30, okay? 
And this, now it's saying the batteries are down because I've been using it. So they're running uh, 21 volts. Normally it would be 24 volts. So that's why it's beeping. It's trying to tell me I got a strain on it here. And as you can see, we're uh, rainy. It's, it's terrible weather outside. So it, it's, yeah, it's struggling. But has this been doing well? Oh yeah. Normally, you've, yeah. Been, you've been able to charge your batteries? Been able to run the refrigerator, the microwave, that's a thousand, you know, a kilowatt microwave. Uh huh. Uh, I just wait for like 10 o'clock, thereabouts, and this thing will have the both green lights on. And uh, yeah, you can uh, make coffee, whatever you want. And everything has to work together. You know, it's like we were talking about, well, but turn the lights on. Well, it all has to feed back to the panel. And there's two systems. I have uh, the DC lights, like on a, a day like today where it's been raining all day, I'm mostly on DC. Yeah, we have, these. this is 24 volt lights. So we're not just dependent on the uh, power inverter. All right, so I can have those on at night, things like that, and uh, it'll light the place up. They're yard lights, okay? Uh, the ones they put on the walkways and the like. And the box that comes in, it will actually say 12 volt, you know, supply, battery operated. So I just picked them up at Lowe's and I just put the two of them together to make 24 volts. So that's why there's two of them on. <laughs> so what's this thing? The amateur radio. Uh, if you're out in the woods, uh, they actually have what they call wilderness protocol for injured campers or hikers. Uh, so if you need medical help, um, you can hit it on the repeater. And they're on the mountaintops, almost every mountaintop, every state. So if they linked everything, you could actually talk to California. So, but here, uh, Schuylkill County, they just have four uh, transmitters. They, they pick up and retransmit wh whatever you say. Right. And the, uh, the radio you heard, that's on DC. It works in the car, so we have it in there. She works for sign language. Okay, so I'm trying to think what else I could get her to do. But, come on, sit. Sit, sit, come on. See, it doesn't work if you tell her. <laughs> Alright, so you might be wondering, this is an Earthship house, right? Well, not quite. Typically, Earthship homes are built using tires rammed with dirt for a few reasons. First of all, it's a way to reuse something that people normally throw in the garbage. Second, it's pretty economical because you can usually get tires and dirt for free. But lastly, and most importantly, depending on where you live, the design of the house can utilize the thick earth-filled walls in order to eliminate your heating and cooling bills. And even though Will had used tires to build his greenhouse, Bill's house is built using cinder block filled with concrete. In theory, as long as the house is built correctly, the cinder block walls should still have the same energy saving effect. Well, the contractor did the hard part. Okay, yes, he did the hard part. He laid the block, uh, Put the footer in, measured it out. He had the uh, ran the dozer to, um, you know, dig it out and put the cistern in. We have a cistern, 2,000 gallon cistern. So he figured all that out, you know. And then uh, once we had the trusses on, uh, he put the roof on. But then we had to stop. Yeah. You know, so winter came and went. <laughs> and then we got back to it. Yeah. And that's coming again. And so for people who don't know how this type of system works, what's the idea here? Well, it's the same thing as getting heat from the earth. Your, your back wall is covered with dirt, or you have tires, and the idea is it comes up to the earth's temperature, which is like 60 degrees, and that radiates into the house. All right, underground is gonna be at the same temperature. So if you're 100 degrees, you're drawing air through there, you're getting 60 degrees into your area. Now, this is on solar, so it's not costing us any energy. You don't have to pay for it. Now what's going to happen here, the reason this is like three feet below, uh, we're going to play with the freeze line, okay, with some uh, insulation. Probably just come back 
you know, and they, it'll be under that drip thing, and then it'll be filled with dirt. And the idea is to keep uh, keep your dirt from freezing, and it keeps the house warm. This is something I haven't seen actually. So uh, there's one by every cooling vent. Did you come up with that? Uh, well, Will was using it in his greenhouse, all right, because he was having uh, uh, moisture problems. Uh huh. And so he picked up a solar-operated fan, and it helped him a lot. So he, he sent me three of them. I got two of them in. I got one more to put in. But it also brings the air in from the uh, cooling tubes. Where do the cooling tubes come in the building? Well, they're right outside here. You can see the depth. This would be where one of them is. This is another one. And they go into the rooms. The uh, one room, uh, well, we got stuff stuck in it. Conduit and whatever. But uh, it goes back to the back wall. All the way to the back wall? All the way to the back wall in that corner. And you can see where the pipes are. And then it'll come up like a regular register. Okay, so we can open it or close it as we will. All right, so what are they talking about here? Basically, they're talking about getting free air conditioning by burying a tube under the house that hot air is going to move through and cool down and then come into the building as cool air. And in the winter, when you want to keep the warmth inside the house, you're going to close off the vents that are in the floor so that the cool air doesn't come into the warm room. And the final thing that Bill isn't mentioning here is that all of the glass on the house is facing in the southern direction because in the winter, the sun comes up in the southern sky, comes in through the windows of the house, and warms up the space. So we're in a rush for this weekend. We're going to do bottle walls. And the idea is to get these doors so we can seal the thing up. You know, we worked with Wills down in uh, Ambler, and it took quite a bit to get those bottles in. But, and it's a multiple process. You, you get your bottles in, and then you got to come back and fill it in. And then you have to clean your bottles. <clears throat> and he was doing a, uh, a pattern, you know, like a swirl. You know, and I've seen some of them where they have a phoenix and all kind of stuff. It's kind of neat. Cool. They asked me how many bottles I wanted to work on. They said, I'll do one. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a few small rocks. Uh, <laughs> I told Will he could start his rock garden with that one. But we're, we're going to use them for decoration. Um, yeah, it was solar panel. Now this is the internet, so it's used net. Um, now we have another dish that, that will go for uh, GEO's 19 satellite. And it should give us uh, 253 channels for free. Okay. And they're all in the same direction. So. Uh, all right. We have our gutter system. We only have the back gutter on. What we needed to catch most of the water. And of course it's going into the cistern, 2,000 gallon cistern. And it's usually, when I look at it, it's usually full. So what are you standing on right here? Uh, this is a cistern right through here. And you can see this is the entrance and there's just a, it ends. But then these are possible openings if we wanted them. And well, you can still see part of the cistern. And it's just this whole area. It's just one big tank. Now we have it on this side. So if we want another one, if we don't get have enough water, we can put another one in. So all the water right now is just coming from this tank? Right off, yeah. yeah. Right into this tank, right off the roof, into the tank. Come out every couple of days, get the leaves out. <laughs> yeah, you're out in the woods, you're going to have leaves. <clears throat> and then, uh, like I say, once we get the more of the uh, roof on, we'll have those wings to actually catch some more water. You're going to get some incredible sunsets. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've got all these windows to watch it, too. The story doesn't end there. 
They've begun using this house as a classroom when they form something called the Tamaqua Sustainability Project and hosting workshops in order to teach people these unique skills. In the fall of 2020, I was invited to teach a bottle brick wall workshop. I took the opportunity to meet everyone that was involved one-on-one, -on -one, to hear their unique stories, and to share them with all of you. When I got involved with Will and Bill three or four years ago at this point, um, we were just building a little greenhouse in Will's backyard. <laughs> All right, what are you doing, Nikki? I'm uh, finishing this bottle wall, putting a final layer of concrete on. And then we're going to clean it off, clean off all the bottles just like this to create that beautiful stained glass effect from the bottles. And that project served as a prototype um, for this project, which is a single family home on 18 acres of land. And the vision for this site is 18 acres of experimental architecture. So this weekend's bottle workshop was our very first um, community workshop that we've, we've run. And uh, we really wanted to, you know, bring a, a group of students in uh, both to share the uh, skills and resources and knowledge that we've gained just by doing these projects, you know, provide students with a, a sense of confidence that they too can build um, like this. Um, and also to get a little bit more work done on the house that we wouldn't otherwise have been able to do. Yeah, I feel like we went in here knowing relatively little about, you know, we, we were kind of in a one frame mindset about, oh, okay, we'll build a cob house, you know, because we had talked to some people about that. But, you know, we met so many people with so many different opinions about, you know, what kind of materials are good for which kind of climates. I think, uh, I think this has expanded my, uh, uh, my, my mindset about exactly how we could go about doing what we want to do. And uh, it's also given us a lot of great connections. Really cool people came to this lots thing. Of experience lots of experience. Yeah, lot, and lots of experienced people as well <clears> who, <throat> who know what they're talking about and who we'd love to stay in touch with. Yeah, I mean, it was really cool to work on the Earth ship uh, with Will and Bill. You know, that was, that was a really good experience. It's really good to get some um, hard labor in, like especially working with the Earth. I think that's really important. I don't really get a lot of that, like being in the city, living in an apartment, I don't really have access to like land or much less land that I can dig up and like work with my hands and my feet and, but having been able to do that in the past month, it's like, it feels great. And you know, it feels great to like wake up sore and it's just, it feels like it's really needed. And I feel like, I feel stronger. Uh, so it's a great kind of side thing that I didn't see coming, great benefit that I didn't see coming. Are we filming right now? We are now. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> are we on camera? Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Hold on. I'm frizzed out, okay? It's been Cut. raining. Cut. Cut. <laughs> I need to edit. It was cool to, to be able to physically build something, yeah. you know, to get to, to follow a process from, from start to finish, you know? To be in the midst of a project like this that's, like, going on and just to hear from people that are working on it, that have worked on it on different iterations of, like, something like an Earthship, you know? Yeah, and just like a different um, lens to try to like learn something instead of just reading about it in a book or watching like a YouTube video on it or something. Mm -hmm. um, to actually just like fall into it in person and have, you know, a more um, tangible experience mm -hmm. to then start your education. Is it Bill that lives there? Mm -hmm. I just mix Bill and Will up like <laughs> the names. But it was, it was like, honestly, I really liked hearing him talk and like everything he had to say about like the solar panels and like the energy he uses and like the water. Yeah, yeah the water. Like I, I felt like every time like he like had a moment to just like sit down and talk to people it was like, yeah, I got, I got a lot out of that. Um, I got a lot out of like the hands on. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever been a part of anything that like kind of threw you into it this much like here hop on this power tool yeah like like wash all these things so that was definitely helpful to like see see like what goes into like building these walls the difference between you know sustainability of a traditional house versus an earth house uh if you buy your own land and build your own house on it um then you're just paying you're not paying mortgage 
Yeah, I mean, you're, you're paying for the cost of building the house in the first place, but not having to not buy expensive. something that somebody else built is huge money also, saver. If you so. if you follow an earth ship built, uh, there's a lot of little things you can do to cut down on your bills or not have bills, for instance, electricity. And so if you don't have a mortgage and you don't have bills, yeah, if you're using what solar you power, have? water power, yeah, it sounds it, like a pretty good deal to me. <laughs> excited about that life. Yeah, well, uh, my name is Tom Morose and I'm the co-director, co-owner of Stonehenge Gardens. It's a holistic learning center. Tamaqua Sustainability Project is now uh, located um, just about three miles north of Stonehenge. Stonehenge has been around for over 50 years and they, there is a greenhouse attached to the uh, farmhouse that was basically falling apart and uh, we had a colleague run into somebody that was building a greenhouse in Ambler and we, you know, we decided to use the Earthship technology to rebuild our greenhouse and then through that we got connected through uh, to Will and his project there was a lot of similarities and so we got you know we got to talking and um, I think Will was exploring you know places where he, they, he might be able to build an Earthship Building a an off grid passive solar house in Tamaqua. That's really to me what's what's most interesting about this project. Got interested in natural building from the perspective of being interested in preserving the earth and not destroying the wonderful natural world that we live in, which is what's going on. So how how can we live without destroying where we live? That's what I'm interested in. Yeah, we hope that this initial bottle brick workshop will serve as a foundation for many more workshops to come. Um, we have a lot of ideas, um, including earthen floors and perhaps aircrete and maybe hempcrete, other types of um, experimental building materials. And we're really excited for Bill's Borough and, and just the Tamaqua Sustainability Project in general as a platform for knowledge exploration and material exploration and exploration in community and exploration in ecology. You know, when I got involved with um, this project and with building earthships in general, I noticed immediately that there was a close connection um, between the designer and the builder and the actual structure and also the earth and, you know, the systems that exist such as the sun and um, the ground and rain and you know I don't necessarily think that earth ships by themselves are the uh, is a panacea for all of the problems that we face as a society however I think the philosophies that they're built off of um, you know which include being closer to the earth and, and nature um, and also closer to ourselves, I think that it's these ideas that we have to adopt on a greater scale. Well, that's the end of the video, but it's not the end of the story. My 2022 is already jam-packed, and as always, I'm going to be sharing my adventures with all of you. And thank you for riding Off-Grid Guru Airlines. We hope you enjoyed your flight, and we'd like to see you on board again. 